I'm Bob Darrell. I'm an alcoholic. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about our experience with what I've come to believe is the most difficult step, two steps in all of Alcoholics Anonymous, step eight and nine. Do uh, you know, in a sense, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded on one man's eighth step. Those of you who know the history of AA, uh, Dr. Bob Smith was 12-step by Bill Wilson, Mother's Day weekend in May, the second weekend in May, 1935. And he fell in love with the, all the principles of AA. The, the turning your will and your life over the care of God, the confession of shortcomings, the helping others. But there was one thing that Dr. Bob would not do, and he would not go out and face his creditors and, and all the people he owed amends to. And consequently, he drank again. And when he came back from a, a medical conference in Atlantic City, he was so drunk, he was unconscious, that the conductor of the train laid him on the side of the platform at the Akron station and his office manager came down and got him and they eventually took him back to Ardmore Street. Bill Wilson was staying there and Bill and Ann tried to nurse him back to health and he was just out of it. And he came to on what most historians believe was early in the morning of June 10th, 1935. And he came to shaken and just terrified and full of remorse and, and oh, just could, hands were like this. And he said to Ann, he said, what, what day is it? And they said, it's June 10th. And he said, oh, it can't be June 10th. I have a surgery to perform the morning of June 10th. And Dr. Bob was a proctologist, so you can use your imagination what kind of surgery this might have been. And Bill Wilson gave Dr. Bob his last drink and a sedative and set him into the surgery because he gave him the sedative and the beer because his hands were shaking so much. Imagine being that patient waiting for your surgeon to come in and he's going like this. Whew. We should build a statue of that guy somewhere. And we don't know what happened. We know the guy lived. That's all we know. We don't really know anything else. Some of the historians have tried to find out. I mean, I'd like to know. I mean, we know he lived, but did he whistle when he walked? I mean, we don't, we don't know. Um, and Dr. Bob got out of that surgery late that, in, still in the morning of June 10th, and disappeared. And nobody knew where he was. And he didn't come back that morning, that afternoon, that evening, and finally almost midnight, he came back to the Smith residence on Ardmore Street and everybody had been afraid that he was drinking. And he wasn't drinking. He was out seeking out everyone that he ever owed amends to that he could find. And Dr. Bob Smith never drank again the rest of his natural life. And the low estimates is that he helped personally over 5,000 people. And I don't know how many millions of people they helped, that they helped, that they helped. We are sitting in this room today, down line from the two men, Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson. And I think our very lives hung in the balance of Dr. Bob's eighth step. What would have become of us? If Dr. Bob would have dug his heels in one more time and said, uh, I'm not going to face those amends, would he have stayed sober? Would Alcoholics Anonymous have been formed? There's nothing in his experience to lead me to believe that he would have stayed sober because he didn't before. And that was the one thing he wouldn't do. In June 10th, 1935, he took the bit in his teeth, as it says in our book. And he went out and searched out everyone. Um, and I understand Dr. Bob's misgivings. I was terrified of the immense. I remember sitting in meetings as a newcomer and just think, looking at the heavy, hearing people talk about it. I thought, oh, no, 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 no. I, that's good for you. Yes, you make immense fine. But you, I, I live like an animal on the streets. I mean... Oh, my God, if I would have known I had to pay back all that money, I wouldn't have stolen so much. I mean, oh, no. 
Oh, gosh, guys, I couldn't... There was guys that went to prison because I, I squealed on them. There, there were, there's one guy that I've never found him to this day. I've hired detectives that I, I, I took a knife with a blade about this long and opened his chest up. He, he lived, but he'll never be the same. How do you make amends to those people? How do you make amends to guys that go to prison as a result of your actions? How do you make amends to the thousands of people that just happened to get in my way? Nothing personal. You just went to the bathroom in some bar and you came back and I'd stolen all your money. Or you left your car unlocked and you came back out from work and somebody had taken the radio and the tape player out of your car. Or you left your woman and you left your purse lie down, you turned around and you came back and your purse is gone. And I'm not talking about one or two instances. I'm talking about a way of life. And I looked at the amends and I thought, it's, it's, it's too big. I can never do this. I'll never make it right to my parents. My parents won't ever have anything to do with me again. And I knew that I didn't deserve them in my life after all I'd done to them. But there's a process that permeates the very fabric of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's a, it's a principle called synchronicity. Carl Jung talked about synchronicity. And a synchronistic universe is a universe that is very accommodating. It's a universe that when, when you need to go from point A to point B, and you really need to go there, but you can't, the abyss between A and B is something you can never surmount from the moment of need and desire. With God's help, the universe starts rearranging itself to eventually, in God's time, make the impossible possible. And you don't have to sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous very long to hear thousands of stories of, of men and women who come into AA and the, and the government has taken their children and they will never see their children again. And then two years later, they're at a meeting and their kids are there with them. Guys that have been on medications and, and, and in psychiatric hospitals for 10 and 15 years, that, that competent psychiatrists will told them, you'll never be off medication, you're never going to be free, you're always going to be mentally ill. And three or four years later, the lights are on and they haven't taken anything. And they're alive and vital, happy members of society. We see this stuff happen all the time. And it just... In, in Alcoholics Anonymous, the impossible just takes a little longer. That's all. And I, I was faced, I, I'm so glad that I got to a point where I, I didn't believe AA would work. I didn't believe these people's notions about amends were right. But what I did believe in is I believed in the hopelessness and futility of my life as I'd been living it. And I was willing to follow some directions. And, and one of the first amends that uh, I, I've had to, I had to make a couple amends that were just terrible in early sobriety. And I wasn't even up to step eight and nine yet. But when I got sober, I was facing two years in a state penitentiary. And I had been sentenced by a judge to two years. And then he gave me a break and put me in a rehab for observation for a while. And if I could do certain things, I wouldn't have had to do the two years. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't stay sober. And I went on a drunk. And the minute they threw me out of there, I was on the streets. And I knew that the warrants had been issued. And I started running. And I ran 2,000 miles across the continent of the United States from the East Coast to Las Vegas. And I ended up in a hospital there. And I'm sober not very long at all, and all of a sudden I am haunted by the anxiety of these warrants out for my arrest. And I know it's just a matter of time, and I'm scared to death. And I went to an old-timer in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm, I'm telling him about these warrants, and he said to me, he said, well, kid, he said, you have to contact the courts and offer to go back there at your own expense and to do the two years and any other time they want to tack on. And I thought, what, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? You want me to go to prison for two years? Hey, I'm sober. I'm not drinking. I'm going to meetings. This is good. He said, listen, kid, you have to do that. No, I don't jail well. I don't jail well. This is not good. No, 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 no. This is not good. He says, you have to do that. He says, do you want to stay sober? 
Yeah, I want to stay. He said, do you want to die of alcoholism? No, I don't want to die of alcoholism. He says, listen to me. How long are you going to be able to stay sober under the anxiety of looking over your shoulder? That you can never use, a, you can never use your ID again? You can never get a job and tell them your real name and give them your, your social security number? Or every time a police car goes down the street, your gut will just go like that. How long are you going to be able to stay sober under those conditions until you will be compelled to drink or take something to take the edge off of that anxiety? Mm -hmm. And when he said that, I, I thought, ah, crap. Because I knew he's telling the truth. I knew what he's saying is right, but I don't like... This is a dilemma. Dilemma is when you don't like either alternative, you know? It's like live by spiritual basis or die an alcoholic death. Uh, uh. And so I said, well, what do I do? And he said, well, he said, why don't you write your, your, your probation, your parole off, probation officer, P.O., Write him a letter. Tell him where you're living. I said, no, I don't want to tell him where I'm living. He says, tell him where you're living. And tell him in that letter that you're willing to come back there and do the, any time they want you to do. You will do anything that they want you to do. You just want to be free of this and you want to make it right. And then he said, tell them in the letter that, that you'll call him. And he said, give him enough time to get the letter. He said, give him 10 days. Give him a time and a date. And put it in the letter that you'll call him at that time of date. And then you must call him at that time. And I wrote the letter and showed it to him. And he looked at it and said, good, that's a good letter. And I took it to the mailbox and went, I put it in the mailbox. The minute it went down, I tried to get my hand in there to get it back. I'm like, my head went nuts. I thought, oh, my God, what am I doing? I'm listening. He's never been to prison. Why am I listening to him? Oh, and I, I was going to leave town. I was just overwhelmed with anxiety now and fear. And a guy said, you can't leave. He said, you'll drink again. So I toughed it out. I tell you, it was the longest 10 days of my life. And the day came and I went to the phone and I'm, I'm shaken from fear. And I called, this, I called this office and this woman answered the phone and she was expecting my call. And she said, He's a, I'll put you right through. And she put me through and my PO got on the phone and said, uh, I've talked to my supervisor and we've talked to the courts and you don't have to come back and make, you don't have to do the two years, but there's certain things we want you to do. And you have to report to somebody in Las Vegas and you have to go to these DUI classes and you have to send us money. But it was all things I could do. I could do really fairly easily. And I remember walking away from that phone higher than I've ever felt on any drug or alcohol ever made. And it was like it was like a postcard from God. Dear Bob, we got your back. Love God. And it was the beginning for me of starting to trust Alcoholics Anonymous and ultimately the power that's behind AA that works through the people and the principles here. You see, I'd been around AA for years, but I never put my self-interest aside to do anything you suggested. I would only ever listen to you if it agreed with what I wanted to do anyway. And if it was threatening to me or high risk, I ain't doing it. Because I was still at the wheel of my ship. And that was the first demonstration of a willingness, really, that I ever had. And I wish I could tell you that was the, the, the worst amends. I've had the, some even worse than that. My, my parents, people, my parents had nothing to do with me. I didn't come from a bad family. My parents loved me very much. But I had battered them emotionally over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many times I, I lied to them. How many times I disappointed them. How many times I stole from them. I stole so much from them that we have these, these places in, in the states that are called pawn shops where you take stuff that doesn't, you, well, you're supposed to belong to. You take it and you sell it or pawn it. And then they, they, hold, they hold it until you pay them back. My father 
became friendly with the guy who owned the pawn shop in that town from buying his own stuff back, right? By the end, uh, the last two or three, probably two, three years, they wouldn't even answer my phone calls. They would have nothing to do with me. One of the hardest things on them is they watched me for a number of years get sober and get drunk. And they would get their hopes up. And then I would go on another drunk and dash their hopes again. And I, that's a brutal thing to do to someone who loves you. Get their hopes up and then smash them again and get them up and, until you start losing all hope. And my parents were forced for their own mental health and their own survival to cut me out of their life. But they could not cut me out of their heart. And so my father slept 15 or 16 hours a day. And my mother went to a psychiatrist and took medications because she couldn't live with what had happened to her son. And I did that. And I knew that I did that. I knew, I wished that I'd had bad parents that I could have blamed and hid behind their bad behavior. I wish they would have beat me, but they never did anything except love me. They weren't perfect, but I always knew they loved me. And so I get sober and people in Alcoholics Anonymous are encouraging me to start making amends to my parents. And I, I thought, I said, you know, you don't understand. It's too late. It's too late. It won't work. And I thank God the people in AA really aren't big on my opinion about anything, really. They don't really care. They just said, here's what you want to do. You're going to start calling your mother and you don't call collect. <laughs> First time I ever did that, it blew her mind. She answers the phone. I say, hi, Mom, it's Rob. She goes, Rob, where are you? Are you in Pennsylvania? No, I'm in Nevada. Well, well, well the operator didn't ask me to pay for the call. I said, Mom, I paid for the call. Her voice went up an octave. She went, you paid for the call? <laughs> she couldn't believe it. All my life, I, I treated my parents like they were welfare or something, like, that, like, like a sense of entitlement. They owe me. She couldn't believe I paid for the call. They told me to start sending cards and letters and notes and remember birthdays and remember their anniversary and remember Father's Day and Mother's Day and Christmas and what they were encouraging me to do is to act like the son I never was. And when I was a year sober, my parents still still did not believe or trust me. Because they had seen me lot, you know, get their hopes up so many times. But they decided to come out to Las Vegas to kind of take a look. And here's the attitude they had. They had, you know, he's probably still a bum. But hey, We've never been to Las Vegas. <laughs> so that's why they came to Las Vegas. They came out here thinking it was skeptical. And I picked him up at the airport with my first sponsor, Dick, and his wife, Gladdy, And we took him out to dinner. And I took him to my home group. And they got to see me with you. And I have never been better than when I'm with you. And they got to see me with the guys that I got sober with, that I kidded around with. They got to see me with the old timers who poked fun at me continually. They got to see the camaraderie. They got to see a little bit about Alcoholics Anonymous and how the laughter and the tears and the sincerity and the, the unified feeling in the room that we really cared about each other. And... My parents loved Alcoholics Anonymous. They didn't understand it, but they loved it. I mean, they'd sit, to me, to them, it was the most amazing thing they'd ever seen. They'd sit in meetings and they'd laugh when people would say stuff and they'd, they'd tear up and, oh my God, she got her kids back. Oh, that's really, you know, they just, it was great. I mean, they loved AA. Right before they left to come back, to, to go back to Pennsylvania, I had my amends list of the financial amends I owed my father. And I went to, over to the coffee shop at the hotel where they were staying. And I, I sat down with them and I had my list out. And I owed them a lot of money from all the times I had gone to them and borrowed money when I was in trouble, borrowed money to pay fines so I didn't go to jail, borrowed money to pay the rent so I wouldn't be homeless. And it added up to a lot of money. And I figured it out, and it was going to take me 12 and a half years to pay it back. 
12 and a half years. And I told my father this plan, I'm going to start giving you so much a month. And my dad and my mom looked at each other and they just, my dad said to me, he said, listen, listen, Rob, we don't want you to pay us back. This is the first time in years that we had any hope that you're going to be okay. All we want is you to stay sober and keep going to that AA and doing what you're doing. And you don't forget the money. You don't owe us the money. I was elated. It was like hitting the lottery, man. I just, I remember leaving there. I'm on my way to my sponsor's office. I'm on cloud nine. This is great. This, oh, I don't have to pay. This is wonderful. I thought, I like this amends stuff. This is good. And I started thinking about other people I owed money to. Maybe I could get them to see the light like my parents did. And I went into my sponsor's office and I told him the great news. My dad said I didn't have to pay him. And my sponsor said, I don't care what your dad said. It's your debt. You owe him and you have to find a way to pay him. I'll tell you, if there's ever a time you'd need to change sponsors, it's right about then. <laughs> And I said, but Dick, what am I going to do? I, I don't know how, I can't, if I send him a check every month, it's not going to mean anything to him. He won't cash it, it won't. He says, I don't know. But if you're willing, I believe God will show you a way. And I worked, I worked as a cashier in a store, running a cash register. And my father had one hobby that was almost an obsession. He collected old coins and old dollar bills. And in the late 1970s and early, even into the early 80s, there was still a lot of the old silver, real silver coins in circulation in the United States. There were, there were a lot, still gold certificates in circulation. There were still silver certificates. There were still war pennies, the silver, or, uh, wheat pennies and the war nickels that were part silver. My dad loved all that stuff. He was obsessed with it. He'd, he'd sit and read the books and he'd lay them all out on the table and, you know, it was just, it was his hobby. And the inspiration came to me that every day through that cash register, I see some of that stuff. And I went to my boss and I said to him, I said, do you, would you mind if I were to buy this stuff out of the register for my father? And he said, I don't care. I don't collect that stuff. Kid, do whatever you want. And so in four years, a little over four years, I saved up at face value what I owed my father, what would have taken 12 and a half years. But I'll tell you what happened. From the moment I started to move in that direction, it was like I started to get lucky. And all of a sudden, I'm getting raises and bonuses. And there was a guy in A had a little moving business. He'd pay me $100 for four hours work, and he'd pay me cash under the table. And all of a sudden, what would have taken 12 and a half years took a little over four. And I was able to give my father all those that several thousand dollars in, in rare coins and bills, and we were even. And I knew he, wouldn't, he would have to take that. He could no longer not take that than a crack addict could give back an eight ball. He couldn't do it. <laughs> couldn't do it. And he took that stuff, and, uh, and my father uh, died a few months after that. And I was able to go back to Pennsylvania and bury my father and be there for my mother and sister. And I buried him with no unfinished business. I buried him knowing that he knew that I knew that he loved me. I buried him knowing that he knew that I loved him. I buried him knowing that he got to watch me demonstrate demonstrate that I was different, that I was standing on a different footing, that this was just not, my recovery was not just talk, that I had actually taken actions that impressed the hell out of him. And I, I in the book it talks about a, a, a mere mumbling that we're sorry won't fill the bill. It talks about a demonstration that that's why the chapter where the amends are, it's called into action. It's not into talking. It's into action. And it's about a demonstration. And I'll, I'll say one more, a couple more things. I get a lot of guys that I sponsor who are sober a lot of years and their, their lives are financial disaster areas. And for no apparent reason, 
because they make a lot of money. They make lots of money. But the more money they make, the more bonuses they get, the more raises they get, the more in debt they become. And it's a crazy thing. And a lot of times they'll come to me and ask me to sponsor them or to work with them because I, I live a, a flamboyant lifestyle. I have a lot of abundance in my life, a big house, and I drive a, an amazing car. And, 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 you know, people, it's like they're deluded by self into thinking that they're going to get me to help them and I'm going to show them some kind of trick some kind of financial trick that's going to make them abundant. And every single case to date of these people who are living in a financial disaster area, we always find out that it comes back to unmade financial amends. And it's usually amends that they got away with not making because someone told them, oh, forget about it. Or maybe the person they owe doesn't know that they owe, but they know. And I don't think you can fool the God or spirit within you. And what happens to guys like me, God wants to give me everything, all the abundance in the universe. The problem is, is that I have become and rendered myself an unworthy receiver. You see, I always secretly know if I'm even or not. And if there's people over here that I've screwed over and I've gotten away with it, I'm telling you, I haven't gotten away with it. I just think I have. That's what karma is. You know, the, the, li the literal translation of the word karma into the English would translate as the word doing. You owe some people over here, and your life is crap over here. It's not the universe punishing you. It's you're doing it to yourself, and you don't, you're not even awake to it. If you want to see a great ninth step movie, look at the movie. There's a movie called Flatliners. Where it's about these doctors that were experimenting with death and they brought ghosts back that are haunting them. And these ghosts are destroying them. And they don't understand what's going on until the one doctor figures it out. That in order to put that ghost to rest, he must go and find someone he had hurt and make it right. And I think that in the realm of the spirit, I think that's what we have to do. We have to make this stuff right. Uh, there's no way around it. I wish there was. Um, if I could fool me, maybe I wouldn't have to make all the amends. But I can't fool me. There is always, I'll run over it with justification and rationalization. But in me, there's always been a sense of what, how I must have affected other people. I may be asleep to that, but it, that knowledge is in me just the same. And when I wake up to that, that realization of what I did to this person and, and how it would have felt, other center myself to how it would have felt to have been on the receiving end of that, then I know exactly how to approach them and make it right. Because it's the same way I would want to be approached if the tables were turned. It's no different. I do to, to and for you what I would want and wish and desire to have done to and for me. It's all an even playing field here. And you can run, but you can't hide. And I, I know a lot of guys that are sober a lot of years, and they think they've gotten away with something. They haven't gotten away with anything. Page 127 of the book is a, is a promise and a statement of spiritual cause and effect. And it says something very interesting. It says, for us... Material well-being always follows spiritual progress. It never precedes it. I've seen guys make a whole lot of money in sobriety, but they don't have any material well-being. They can't make enough money. And they're never happy and satisfied, and they always are worried about it and trying to get more and more. And I know other people that have lived, that made the amends and... and pay these people back and really don't make a lot of money, but they're very comfortable and very free of the fear of financial insecurity because they made the spiritual progress. They didn't put the money first. And what's the great illusion about money? Well, how much money do you need? I know. You know how much money you need? 
just enough so you don't have to trust God. Do you know what you want the dollar amount? Five crowns more than you'll ever have. Because whatever you have, it'll, it'll always be not quite enough. Thanks. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm an alcoholic. All right, I'm going to stand on my booster seat. I love it like I can bounce. Um, I love to talk about amends. This is like my favorite topic of all times. I really like talking about the sex inventory because it makes people uncomfortable. But I like talking about amends because there is no step that I haven't had such a miraculous experience with. Um, There is nothing that has been so instantaneous as the healing in amends. You know, Bob talked a lot about financial amends, you know, and I'm laughing because, you know, I have three kids, so I am poor. Um, (laughs) I'm kidding, but really, no. Um, You know, my husband and I, we're not wealthy. We are, you know, your typical middle-class, working-class Americans, and we have three kids, and I live extremely well, and I want for nothing. I mean, I might want a Mercedes, but I have, <laughs> but I have a Kia, and I'm happy with it. I have never gone hungry. I have never not paid the bills. I have never not had the rent. I have never, ever, ever wanted for material things. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. And we were talking about amends and talking about finishing the steps because I'm I'm sort of a stickler. Um, I'm a bit of a brat because I happen to believe that um, doing nine and a half steps, well, it doesn't really count. <laughs> In my experience, when it says having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, it means I actually have to complete the steps. And not completing my amends means I didn't complete it in my experience, according to my sponsor. And since she's right and she knows everything, it must be true. Um, With that being said, you know, I was talking to a woman the other day, and she was telling me, she's like, when am I going to get rid of my fear of financial insecurity? I said, well, how many amends do you have left? And she goes, well, I can't find this one, can't find that one, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm talking to her. I said, well, maybe you need to go back to the first step because you're obviously not properly motivated. Because when I was walking on amends, my sponsor put a bottle of vodka and the big book on my on her kitchen table. And she asked me, what's easier to do? Think about that for a minute. Is it easier to go back and drink and die an alcoholic death or is it easier to knock on that person's door? I mean, in reality, that's the truth because if I haven't had an entire spiritual experience as a result of these steps, that's exactly what I'm going to do. When I do nine and a half steps, I do just enough to feel okay for a little while and that when that runs out, I'm screwed because I haven't gained access to the power. I've used the steps to feel a little better. Um, so I have a habit of doing that. I keep actually, I keep a bottle of booze in my house for just for that because I really like to mess with people. So I get a sponsor who's coming over to explain to me exactly why she doesn't need to make that amends or pay that back. And I asked her, I said, well, is that a Louis Vuitton bag? Do you really need to have that bag? You know, do you need to have a Prada bag? Can't, you know, a $5 bag from Kmart be good enough? Can't you take that money for that Louis Vuitton or Prada bag and pay back some of the amends that you owe? And yeah, but I really like my Louis Vuitton bag. And I say, well, what I want doesn't matter. So what you want doesn't matter. Stop buying Louis Vuitton and pay back your money. Um, but what I, I, what I like to talk about and the amends that hung me up wasn't the financial amends. I mean, I owed a lot of money, and I stole a whole hell of a lot. But I, mean, I kind of get that I owed people. Like, I get when you steal people's stuff, you got to pay it back. I get that my parents, you know, spent a whole lot of money on me. I was in and out of rehabs and mental hospitals most of my life until I got sober. In fact, I remember distinctly saying to my mom when I went back to, when I went to college, I said, well, you know, because in the States you have to pay for your education. Um, I said, well, Mom, where's my college fund? And she goes, that was your last rehab. <laughs> and I laughed. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, Mom, why didn't we go on vacation? Because you were in rehab. 
Um, <laughs> um, but w- the financial amends weren't such a big deal because I really did understand that I owed it. But what I did is I had a rationalization and justification as to why I didn't have to forgive or make amends to the people that I thought harmed me. You know, I'm like Bob. I grew up in a household, and I've said this, and it's no, ra- it's no justification, it's not excuses, but I grew up in a household that was very violent. And so when I got sober, you know, there was a part of me that really believed that I was the alcoholic that I was and my life was a mess the way it was because of what they did to me. Because I'm a very sad little girl and I was hurt really badly. And if I had a better life and I had the silver spoon in my mouth and all those things, maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't be this terrible alcoholic that I am. Um, you can hear the dripping sarcasm in that. Um, I get sober and I still blamed my parents. I blamed my childhood. I blamed my family for what I had become. And I took just enough responsibility to, you know, to, I'd be like, well, they didn't mean it, but I secretly wanted my family to be different. I secretly wanted them to change. I secretly wished that I had a life that was different than my own. You know, the big book talks about it, and it says in the family afterward and to the, uh, and to the chapter to the wives, it talks about the past being the greatest possession an alcoholic could have. You know, that that dark past, those, that pain, those things that we hide in our closet, that they are the greatest possession, and they're key to life and happiness to other people. I didn't understand that. I still believe that if I had had different circumstances in my life, I wasn't grateful for my experiences. I didn't understand that all things in God's world were as exactly as they were supposed to be. That it's not a matter of deserving or any of those things, but I am who I am because of who, because of what has happened to me. And I've become what I've become because of what has happened to me. Inversely, I've helped the people that I've helped because of who I am, because of what has happened to me. So I had done inventory a bunch of times. And you ever make an amends, but you don't really make an amends. You go in and you make the approach and you call up the person. You sit down and have the conversation. And you take responsibility or your part. And I love that Bob pointed that out too. Um, But secretly, you're still pissed off that they didn't behave differently. Because in the big book, it tells us that we're supposed to go to an amends, you know, and we're supposed to be honest, open, and frank, right? It says that we're supposed to not criticize or condemn. In fact, in the nine step, it says don't criticize all the time. In fact, it constantly says, oh, and to the wives and the family afterward as well, which I really believe if you don't think you owe an amends, read those chapters and go back. Um, <laughs> um, and I also use those with my sponsees in the meditation as far as their amends. But that's a whole other thing that I will talk about tomorrow. Um, it tells me in, in, in the nine step, it says that I'm not to criticize. It says that I'm supposed to be honest, open, and frank. So I would go to these amends and I would take responsibility for what I believe to be my part with my family. But I never really forgave them. I still kind of wish they were different. And I still secretly in my head said, well, if only you were different, I could love you more. And I would wonder why my relationships with my mother or my father or my brothers or sisters always seemed to go badly. And I'd go back and make amends all the time. You know, I would go and I'd have a resentment and my sponsor would have me write inventory and I'd write that inventory and then I'd go make the amends. This was our dance. We did this over and over again. My, I mean, they would see me coming, like I'd have the, the, the index card because I, I used index cards, you know, to write my, like what, what I did to harm the person. And I would write it and I'd put it in my back pocket. And if they saw me with an index card in my back pocket, they knew what I was doing. And they just shake their head like, oh, it's time for Carrie to have another one of those conversations with me. God, you know, why can't she just get over it? Um, and I was working with a sponsor at the time, and her name was Cass, and she's a wonderful woman. And she had a daughter my age. And her daughter was an Alcoholics Anonymous as well. In fact, she and I are very good friends. And I had begun to work with her, and I did a fist step with her. And she was the one who taught me about the whole it's not my responsibility thing. And when I made, when I did my fist step with her, you know, we were talking about my resentment with my mother and my, my father and my brother. Um, 
and certain things that had happened in my life. And she pointed out to me, she was like, you know, I have a daughter your age, and I did a lot of the things that your mother did to you. You know, and you seem to be able to love me despite my faults. I'm like, absolutely, I love you. You saved my life. And she's like, how many times has your mother done that for you? How many times has she bailed you out? It's like, yeah, she might have done things that hurt you. She might have turned a blind eye when, you know, my dad was kicking the crap out of us. On the other hand, she also was there for me when nobody else would be. And I stopped for a minute and I thought about that. And I realized that my whole, my whole life I was demanding that my parents be, you know, Mike and Carol Brady. You know, I was demanding that my parents be someone else. And then I would wonder why they would be exhausted by me. Why they'd be worn out by being in my company. Because basically every time I'm around them, all I thought was, if only you loved me more in the way that I want you to. And I, it stopped me and I was like, oh my God. The problems that are happening in my relationships with my mother and my father and my brother are not about them anymore. It's not about what they did to me 20 years ago. It's about what I'm doing to them now. I said, holy shit, what do I do? So I went and, and I used to, the one thing that pissed me off most about the thing and the thing that I refused to let go with my mom was that she had never said that she was sorry. You know, I grew up and like my dad was really violent and he really did beat me. And my brother was a lot older than me and he beat the living crap out of me as well. Um, and my mom never stopped it and I always hated her for that because I'm like, well, you were the one who wasn't on drugs. Like, why didn't you stop it? You know? And I never forgave her and I felt like she never said that she was sorry. And I realized that the problems that I was having, the, spirit, the, the fact that I was so blocked spiritually, and the, the resentments and the expectations and all these things that I had that I thought that I let go of, I really didn't. And I went and I made amends to her, <laughs> for which was actually the final time thus far, knock wood. Um, and it was after having had, you know, having done the, 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 the fist step with my sponsor, Cass, and I went to her and I prayed before I got there. And I said, God, please just let me love her. Let me love her in the way that I want her to love me. Just please let me love her unconditionally. Just please let me be the daughter that I want to be. And I went down and I sat, you know, I was in the backyard with my mama. And I sat down and I said, look, I got to do another one of those amends. She's like, oh, this is like the fifth time. You know, because at this point I was five years sober. I was like, oh, man, oh, she's doing it again. And I, and I, and I, I made amends to her for not, for expecting her to be somebody that she wasn't. And for secretly demanding that my life be different. And she stopped. And she burst out in tears. And she said to me, she was like, Carrie, I'm sorry you had the life that you had. And I wish that I could take it back. And that was the one thing I had waited for my whole life. All I wanted was, I'm sorry. And it wasn't until I was willing to forgive her that she was willing to say it. Because the fact is, is this, is that when, when I'm expecting somebody or I'm refusing to forgive, to let go, to be free until somebody else changes, I'm their prisoner and they're mine. But when I was willing to just say, you know, it doesn't matter, I love you anyway, she gave me the one thing I had always wanted. And you know what? I have yet to have, har have had a harsh word with my mother, and it's been over eight years. Not a fight. And when I start to get irritated, I'm able to say, I think it's getting heated. Let me go, and I will call you back. And I hang up, and I don't yell at her, and I don't say, you're not a good mother to me. You don't love me enough. And she knows that I love her. And when you know what? When she's having a hard time, you know who she calls? Me. Because she knows that I'll listen. Because I was able to, by the grace of God and my sponsor, by the work that I've done, and by being really honest with myself about what was really going on in that relationship. And it had nothing to do with what she did or didn't do and had everything to do with the love that I was not willing to bring. And the criticism that I had. And the same thing happened with my brother. You know, I went and made amends to my brother for resenting him for beating me. And I did the same with my father. And when I went to go make amends to my father, 
at first he didn't want to hear it. He was like, look, I don't want to dredge up the past. You know, he's a, you know, he's an Irish truck, truck driver. He didn't want to hear it. He was like, you know, oh, that's uncomfortable, this motion stuff. I don't want to hear it. You know, so I said, okay, dad. And then every couple, every year or so, I'd say, dad, are you willing to hear that amends? He'd be like, no, no, no. And then last year, um, my nephew has a drug problem and is in, in prison. And I was trying to help him, or I was actually trying to introduce him to friends of mine to help him. And I was talking to my dad about it because he didn't understand, you know, alcoholism and drug addiction. And I was trying to explain to him about the program. He's like, I don't get that program thing and, like, why you guys want to talk about the past and this, that, and the other thing. I don't get it. And I was explaining to him, and I started to explain exactly what amends is. That amends isn't about talking about the past, but about taking responsibility, acknowledging the mistakes that I've made in my life, and then making an effort not to do it again. And he stopped. He goes, so that's what you were trying to do with me all those years? I said, absolutely. And I was actually able to, by being of service to my family, make the amends to my father. But he didn't know what I wanted to do because he was so afraid that I was going to browbeat him with his mistakes. That he didn't realize that I was coming to him not to expect him to acknowledge his mistakes, but simply to set right my own. You know, and that's been my experience. I've never had a bad amends experience. You know, no one's ever kicked me out of their office. Nobody's ever told me to go screw. I have always, when I've gone with the right attitude to an amends, had a beautiful experience. I've, it's always been healing, and I've always walked away a little bit clearer and a little bit lighter. You know, I've actually made amends to and, and been able to set right a lot of the harms that I caused other people. I've been able to pay back a lot of money, and I've actually been able to help other people do the same. And it's been my experience, and this is just for me, in being willing to face who I am, the things that I've done, with the power of God working in my life, that I don't walk through the streets afraid anymore. I don't, I don't go to the supermarket thinking, am I going to run into somebody I knew from high school? You know, do I owe that person money? You know, I've run into people that I've, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I did a lot of messed up stuff, and I forget. I mean, I lose track of people. I've been all over, and I do really, I've done really terrible things. And, you know, I forget sometimes who I hurt. And then I'll see somebody in the parking lot of, like, you know, the 7-Eleven or the AMP, and I realize, it's like, whoa, I owe that person an amends. I did that? Or did you ever, were you ever driving, you know, in your car, and then one of those quiet moments, you remember something really terrible you did? You know, like something you stole that you forgot about, or a person that you hurt that you forgot that you hurt? And it's like, oh my God, I did that? Oh my God. The, fa- the fact is, is this, is that if I remain open and willing to set right the harms that I've caused, and if I remain open and willing to let God re- restructure the fabric of my life, I see these things, and I'm willing to make amends for them right then and there. There have been so many times when I've run into people that I haven't seen for years that I- I've said, you know what, I've harmed you. You know, can we talk about it? Can I get your number? Can I, you know, can we get together? And I've never had somebody saying no. I've never had somebody say, you know what, I don't want to talk to you. I've had people say, I'm not ready to hear your amends. And I'm like, that's okay. When you're ready, please let me know. And when they were ready, they did let me know. I mean, this for me is a beautiful experience. But, you know, I had for so many years what I believe to be, you know, justified anger. I had justified anger against all kinds of people, people who were dead, people I couldn't find. Have you guys ever heard of something called proxy amends? It's when you, if there's somebody who you can't get a hold of, maybe because they're dead, or you've searched for them for you know quite a long time and you can't find them, um, where you write a letter to that person and then you read it to somebody who reminds you of that person and they give you feedback based on what you read. So that, because there are people that I can't find. There are people that have just disappeared. I mean, there are people who probably are hiding from me still. But um, I wrote proxy letter amends, and I read them to people. And I'm ready whenever I see these people to make amends, because I am very clear on the harm that I caused. I'm very clear. I know exactly what I need to say, and I'm absolutely 100% prepared. But I've been able to, because I did the proxy amends, kind of put that karmic amends back into the universe. 
You know, and for me, being willing to do that and showing up in that way has made a tremendous difference in my recovery because I don't have the guilt and the shame and the pain and the, 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 the crap inside of me that I had. And I have an incredible amount of freedom. You know, and I talk about this alcoholic family, right? And I talk about, you know, you would think that, you know, um, that my parents are horrible people and they're not. They're absolutely wonderful people. They're just wonderful people who had a lot of problems. And you'd think that my brothers and sisters and I must be really screwed up, you know. And we kind of, you know, we're, most of us, a lot of us are in the fellowship, so you can kind of say, because we're alcoholics, we're a little messed up. But almost all of us are living on a spiritual basis one way or another. And through me, I went through this process, and I had an experience, and my spirit awoke. And it took a little bit, took a couple times through the steps before my spirit really awoke, because I was very, very blocked. But when it happened and I was really awake, I brought that awakened spirit to my family. I brought that awakened spirit with my husband because, I mean, we drank together, so I did terrible things to him as well. Um, and, of course, he lives with me, and I do all kinds of terrible things all the time. <laughs> you know, I'm an inconsiderate, selfish alcoholic. Um, but I brought this awakened spirit to these circumstances, and I'll tell you what. My whole family... You would never know we were the crazy Irish Catholic alcoholics that we were. I mean, there are people who, like, my sponsees come to my parents' house and they're sitting down because my sponsees come to my parents' house and sit down. You know, my, you know, my family, my parents are a part of my recovery as much as, you know, they're a part of my life. There's, there's not any of that animosity or any of that crap. My brothers and sisters come to my, come to meetings. They, I mean, it's amazing to me. The ones who are not in recovery are open to it. The ones who are still active, we help and we don't judge. And we can have, you know, Christmas dinner. We have a Christmas party at my house every year. I was put in the mental hospital four times by my parents. My mother had me arrested and I fought six police officers in my parents' living room. And they celebrate Christmas at my house. Think about that for five minutes. My mother had me arrested. <laughs> she was so scared of me, she called the cops to protect her. You know? And my brother, who I fought with like a cat and like cats and dogs who beat the living crap out of me, brings his kids and his wife to my house and celebrates Christmas with me. Think about that. That's not me, that's not virtue, that's not anything like that. That is the power of God. That is doing this work having an experience, bringing that experience everywhere that I go, and by virtue, just like my sickness infects other people and makes other people sick, by working this this process and doing this and having this spiritual experience and being willing to face myself as myself without any excuses, rationalizations, demands, expectations, I am who I am, and being willing to bring that into my relationships, I've actually been able to help those around me just by not being a schmuck and bringing love to the table. Can you imagine that? So, you know, I get better and everybody else around me just seems to get better. You know, I expected everybody else to get better so that I could be better. And it turns out it's the exact opposite. You know, and I have, and I'm going to finish it up, but I mean, I have like incredible amen stories. I mean, I share the family ones, you know, because they're really neat. And, you know, you've heard the the tremendous horrors of my childhood. And now, like, you know, I love my father to death. And he goes to my kids' baseball games. In fact, he's at my son's baseball game right now (laughs) while I'm here. I mean, my mom's watching my kids while I'm here. Completely, completely different and exact opposite of what my life was before I got here. Um... But, you know, I've also had tremendous amends experiences everywhere. I mean, I've had amends experiences with friends, paying back money, going back to stores and paying them back, and having the manager look at me and say, okay, well, you stole, you know, $100 worth of merchandise from my store 10 years ago, and you want to pay me back? And being humble enough, you know, and then I shop in those stores later, and I smile at them. Because, you know what, I'm free. I owe them nothing. You know, and doing those things... That has made my life incredibly wonderful. But it's, it's to me an absolute power of God that not only has He taken, you know, this broken alcoholic who couldn't stop drinking and put me right, but He's also taken the relationships that I damaged because of my own bull crap and has been able to set those right as well. That the people in my life actually enjoy 
being in my life. That they're not there because they have to be, because they love to be. And that I could be of service to my family in ways that are it's incredible to me. You know, And for me, and this is the greatest miracle, that I can give back what I've been given. Not just the money, but the love and the t- patience and the tolerance and the kindness you know, that I've been given, to, given by others, that I can give it back to the, my family and back to those in my life and my friends and my sponsees and those that I come into contact with. You know, and this really is what this immense process is all about because I did not know how to love. I only knew how to want. And by doing this process and being humble enough to go back to people and say I was wrong, I've been able to learn how to love. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Bob Darrell and I am alcoholic. Indulge me for a moment of silence. Lord, help me to set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself, everything I think I know about others, and everything I think I know about my own recovery, all for a new experience in you, Lord a new experience in myself, a new experience in my fellows, and a much-needed new experience in my own recovery. Amen. Uh, We're going to talk this morning about our personal experience with Step 10, 11, and 12. Um, You know, I, I think it's, I think, unconsciously my pers- I, over the years, I've had different perceptions of the steps that I didn't even realize I had. And when I was new, I, looking back at my attitude towards step 10, I think I thought that step 10 said, continue to take personal inventory and if I was wrong. Like if someday, I know it's hard to believe, but yeah, right? <laughs> And it doesn't say if, it says when. And there's an implication in that that you're going to be wrong a lot. And I'm wrong a lot. I get off the beam a lot. I get immersed in self a lot. I get judgmental a lot. I get resentful a lot. I get anxious and afraid and worrying a lot. I get out of the wheelbarrow a lot. And I undo or move away from the, the, the direction of the decision of step three a lot. And my very life depends upon me moving back into that arena continually so that I don't get so far out that I end up going the way of too many men and women that I've watched. And, and there, is no, there is no arrival in recovery. Uh, We never outgrow our humanness. Uh, We never outgrow our character defects. If they do go away, it's really in God's hands. I have an interesting letter here. Uh, It was written by Bill Wilson when Bill Wilson was 26 years sober. So here's the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous with over two and a half decades of recovery. And this letter that he wrote is in response to a group in Chicago that wrote him a letter really taking his inventory. And Bill was, a, Bill was not a perfect guy. And Bill had a, made a lot of mistakes in sobriety. And, and, but listen to, listen to his response. And I think this is the benchmark uh, in the attitude that, that I found I would like to have about my own shortcomings. He says to this group in Chicago, he says that you seem disillusioned with me personally may be a new and painful experience for you, but many members have had that experience with me. Most of their pain has been caused not only by my several shortcomings, but by their own insistence 
on placing me, a drunk, trying to get along with other folks upon a completely illusionary pedestal, a station which no fallible person could possibly occupy. I am sure you will understand that I've never held myself out to anybody as either a saint or a superman. I have repeatedly and truthfully said that AA is full of people who have made more spiritual progress than I ever have or can make. That in some areas of living I have made some decided gains, that in others I have seemed to have stood still, and in still others I may have even gone backwards. I am sorry that you are disillusioned with me, but I am happy that even I have found a life here. Bill Wilson, 1960. Wow. I mean, that letter is just amazing to me. Written by the, the, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous in over 26 years of sobriety. And I think it is, it is the, fa it's the exposed fallibility of our senior members that has allowed guys like me to be forthright and transparent. There's a, there's, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous with an unconscious notion that I must be perfect in order just to be equal to the people who aren't. As if I'm coming from behind. And I had that feeling that as far back as I remember, I remember in school feeling at times like I had to be have A's just to feel equal to the kids that got C's. Like I was always coming from behind. Like I come from a, a tremendous place of vacancy that nothing seems, it drives on me and I can't ever seem to fill it or satisfy it. So step 10 is about being wrong and it's about being wrong a lot. And that's the nat that's not because I'm a bad guy. It's just the nature of alcoholism and the human condition. And on page <clears throat> 84 starts this section on on step 10. And it says this this is right after the ninth step promises. And it says this thought brings us to step 10 which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to right any new mistakes as we go along. We have vigorously commenced this way of living as we have cleaned up the past. We have entered the world of the Spirit. Some of you know what it feels like to enter the world in the Spirit, and maybe you don't even know that that's what's happened to you. But all of a sudden, you're sober, and you feel lighter and free, and you're not up in here locked up as much, and you find yourself laughing a lot, and you find yourself caring about other people and getting what's going on with other people at times. I mean getting it. Being able to go within yourself and go within them at the same time and really get what's going on with people around you the realm of the Spirit, the realm where there is no separation between me and you. Um, I'm sure that some of you who do a lot of 12-step work know what that feels like. Know what it feels like to be relieved, not once and for all, but relieved of the bondage of, of self. There's a line <clears throat> in the 12 by 12, it says, Something that I think is the benchmark of how we, how we approach this. And it says that it's a spiritual axiom, which an axiom is supposedly something that's tr true under all conditions. It's a spiritual axiom that whenever I'm disturbed at all, no matter what the cause, no matter what the reason, there's something wrong with me. So the, the, in the realm of the spirit, uh, the, the, the benchmark becomes what has disturbed that? What has, what has come up on my radar that is preventing me from going through with the flow, preventing me from loving those about me, preventing me from being useful, preventing me from trusting God? 
what are the things that have come up on the radar that got me locked up here in the control center trying to run the universe? And there's a there's a little spot check deal here. Uh, it says, we continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Now, those are four things that are repeatedly talked about within this book over and over again. Those are probably the four major manifestations of self. Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I've... <clears throat> There's a, a line in the 12 by 12 in step 7 that talks about the chief activator of all our character defects is self-centered fear. And that's really true. I've lied a lot in my life. Well, most of the time, it's not really lying. It's creative license with the truth. I, you know, it's not really lying. It's just, I'm just like pumping it up a little bit, you know, um, but I don't, I've lied a lot in my life, but I have never lied because I'm a liar. I lie because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what you'll think of me. I'm afraid of not measuring up. And so I'm driven by that form of self-centered fear to, to compromise who I, who I am and, and feed the old dog. And what the old dog is, is that idea that as is right now, who I am is not enough. So I feed the old dog and be something more than what I am, which just reaffirms within me, see? You have to be something more than what you are because no one will ever love and accept you as is. So I feed the old dog. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, we're trying to feed a new dog, the dog of the spirit rather than the dog of self. So we continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear when these crop up. Not if, when. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Essentially, that's step four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and twelve. And why 12? Because that's the whole purpose. That's the primary purpose. When I, when I approach God in step 7, I'm not asking Him to take away the things that stand in the way of my happiness or spiritual growth. Or I'm asking Him to remove the things in me that stand in the way of my usefulness to Him and to my fellows. So it's, it, it, if you buy that proposition in the primary purpose, then it would be in natural order that you would, that step 10, this daily thing we do would be composed of steps 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 12 being the ultimate goal so that I can get back to my primary purpose. And then it says love and tolerance of others is our code. I didn't know what tolerance meant. And I didn't know what love meant. But I'm still not sure. But I didn't know what, what tolerance meant. I thought, here's what I thought tolerance was. I thought tolerance was to be politely pissed off at someone. <laughs> you know, like, boy, are they an asshole. But I'm a big guy. I'm not going to mention it just yet. You know, I thought that's what tolerance was. That's not what tolerance is. That's how you build an ulcer. Uh, what tolerance is is exactly what we start to learn and realize in the fourth step, and this was our course, as we start to change the way we look at, at people, and we look at them from an entirely different angle, rather than this judgmental, playing God, self-centered angle, I start to look at people and see people the way God sees them. And that's a different ball game. And as you enter this world of the Spirit, you start to see even, even people that you've disliked and hated in your life, you start to see them the way that God might see them. And you see the whole picture. You see yourself in them and your own frailties and your own fears that drive you and you realize, that's me. Me on a bad day, but that's me. So tolerance, tolerance is, 
is talked about in mechanics. And if there's any, I'm not a mechanic, and I don't know a lot about mechanics, but I know that in in engines and in motors and things like that, they talk often about tolerances. And what happens sometimes in an engine through friction and heat over the course of time, the tolerances will get off on an engine. And then what happens is you have to take that engine apart, take it to a machine shop, things are shaved down and moved and sanded or whatever the deal is in order to set reset the tolerances to allow the moving parts to move freely of each other without creating so much friction that the engine eventually blows up. And that's really what, what Alcoholics Anonymous has been teaching me in steps four through nine is to change my view of you. Not to change you, but to change my perception of you so that I freely can allow you freely to turn in this world in your own course, and it doesn't create friction within me. It doesn't, I don't have to go home and, and spin in my head about how I can straighten you out. You just are exactly the way you're supposed to be. What a tremendous freedom that would be. I, if you could, if I could live that way 100% seven days a week, I would be a peaceful, serene, and happy man. <coughs> But I do that pretty good for a while, and then it's like a key turns in my head, and I just start noticing stuff about you. You know, I just, I'm, I'm not being judgmental, mind you. I can't help it if I see how screwed up you are. You know, I just, it's, it's insidious the way it creeps back in again. I can see, all of a sudden I can see what an egotistical maniac you are. Yeah. Yeah. So we go into the 10 step promises. These are fantastic promises. As a matter of fact, I don't know why in AA we read the ninth step promises so much in meetings where we're really Alcoholics Anonymous is we're here for the 10 step promises. You can get the ninth step promises and still die of alcoholism if you don't get the 10 step promises. This is what I came here for. And it's easy to forget that, caught up in seeking serenity and peace and, and a new happiness. It's, it's easy to miss this. And here's the 10 step promises on the bottom of 84 and the top of 85. It says, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. That, in the light of what alcohol did to me, would be a sane response to alcohol. Like, whoa. We react sanely and normally. And we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude towards liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. One of the definitions I've heard around AA for, God, for grace is a free, unmerited gift. It comes automatically. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe, and protected. If you have a car and it's a standard transmission and you can you put it in neutral, you can rev that engine all you want. You ain't going nowhere. And I can be around alcohol. I can be around alcohol with resentments in my engine revving. And alcohol doesn't affect me. I've I've worked around alcohol for twenty poof, 24 or years of my sobriety. I've had it in my home for probably on and off for 20 years. I, uh, I had a wine cellar in my house at one time for investment. And exactly what it talks about in this book had come true for me, not as a result of me deciding I'm going to be neutral, as a result of the steps. I was placed in that position of neutrality. 
I, I go to a meeting twice a week at a, at a Skid Row detox, and I've been doing that for over 28 years. And years ago, I used to tell the patients there something that I had to stop telling them because I would lose them. And what I would say to them was the, my the, is was the truth based on my personal experience and the experience of hundreds and hundreds of people that I know. And what I would say to these people is I I can promise you that if you work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous as a way of life, there will come a time where you could be alone in a room with an unlimited amount of your drug of choice, and it will mean no more to you than the furniture. And they would look at me like I was from Pluto. I mean, because they can imagine that. I mean, they can imagine abstinence. Yeah, yeah, we just never go around it and no slippery people and slippery places and oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But they cannot imagine that type of freedom. Because they're, in their mind, they're consigned to a life of abstinence and fight in the bottle and fight in the bag. That's not what we do here. We don't even, we don't even have a step that says quit. We can't quit. We are powerless. Either a power greater than ourselves, either we can move enough of ourselves out of the way to access this power that will do for us what we can't do for ourselves, or we're screwed. There is nowhere else to go. And that's really the miracle of it. it just to kind of reiterate what it says here, at the back of the chapter, uh, working with others, there's a couple pages back here that are really very different from a lot of the crap you hear in meetings. And, I, I mean, you hear some crazy stuff in meetings that really is, is, is not... It's not the same as what it's talking about in this book. Matter of fact, after years after AA was around, a bunch of people got the general service office to approve a book that I just, I can't stand this book. It's called uh, Living Sober. And what it is, it's a bunch of tricks in order not to drink and not work the steps. Right? But as long as you're taking that position, you are still part of the problem. And alcoholism is a funny deal. The more you feed and fight the problem, the stronger it gets. There's a, there's a law in the universe for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. The, I, I spent years fighting the bag and the bottle, and my experience consistently was the harder I fought it, the end up, the, the drunker I got. It, it's like a slingshot effect. Okay, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. I'm really not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking anything. And I can tell everybody else is screwed up that, oh, I'm really not drinking. And now I couldn't take it anymore. And phew, some of the worst drunks I've ever been on were after long periods of just willful abstinence. Because lack of power is my dilemma. The book says self-reliance is good as far as it went, but it couldn't and wouldn't and cannot go far enough. It couldn't go far enough. I heard a speaker years ago who talked about, he said, I, he said, man, I kept quitting drinking and meaning it. He says, I quit drinking a lot. Every time I quit drinking, I'd get drunker than ever. And he finally said, you know, this quitting drinking's killing me. <laughs> Boy, did I get that. I thought, yeah, man, oh, I was tired. I was worn out quitting drinking. I was worn out quitting drinking. Lack of power is my dilemma. That's the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And here it's, it's, it says some interesting things. It says, assuming we are in fit spiritual condition. Now, I'm not talking about a guy who's 30 days sober and has not worked the steps. Please hear that. This is not about that. This is about someone, if you're doing the deal here, and you're working with a sponsor through this book, this, is, this should become your reality. It says, assuming we can, we're spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. 
People have said, we must not go where liquor is served, we must not have it in our homes, we must shun friends who drink, we must avoid moving pictures where they show drinking scenes, we must not go into bars, our friends must hide their bottles if we go to their houses, we mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol at, at all. Our experience shows that this is not necessarily so. We meet these conditions every day. And check this out. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. There is something the matter with his spiritual status. His only chance for sobriety would be something like the Greenland ice cap, and even there an Eskimo would turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. Ask any woman, woman who has sent her husband to distant places on the theory he would escape his alcohol problem. In our brief, in our belief, any scheme of combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. If the alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time, but he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. We have tried these methods, these attempts to do the impossible have always failed. Boy, I know what they're talking about. You know, I, I just, just I'd like a show of hands. How many people in this room at some point in your life have really tried to stay sober and made up your mind you weren't going to drink again and then drank again after that? Whew. Wow. If you're new, I hope you saw how many hands went up. I hope you understand that we are no, this is not a fellowship where we fight the bottle. We have failed fighting the bottle. I almost died because I was fighting in the wrong arena. I was fighting alcohol when I really need to fight alcoholism, this spiritual illness, this malady of my being. And ever since I stopped fighting the bottle and started dealing with the alcoholism, I've been continuously sober. And I tried for seven and a half years the other way, fighting in the wrong, the wrong arena, and I kept getting drunk again over and over again. Or, I, or I'd back myself into a corner, I would have to get on some kind of pills from a doctor because I was just so nuts emotionally. I was fighting in the wrong arena. And I didn't know it because it makes, if you're like me, it looks like, and people, counselors in your family will tell you alcohol is your problem. They always tell you that. You know, every time I ever ended up in a hospital or jail or, when you're an alcoholic of my type, people start telling you what's wrong with you after a while. Matter of fact, they just volunteer. They just show up wanting to tell you what's wrong with you. And no matter who it is, they pretty much say the same thing. And what they say is they'll say, they'll get you somewhere and you're all demoralized. They'll say, Bob, you know, you're really screwed up. And I go, yeah, I know. You know why you're really screwed up? No, I don't. Well, you're really screwed up because you keep getting screwed up. If you didn't get so screwed up, you wouldn't be screwed up. So if you'd stop getting screwed up, you wouldn't be screwed up. And I think, wow, I'm pretty screwed up. Maybe I should stop getting screwed up and I'd stop getting screwed up. And when I stop getting screwed up, I get really screwed up. <laughs> I get so screwed up when I'm not getting screwed up, I eventually got to go get screwed up. And then some guy's saying... Bob, you know you're really screwed up. And I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know why you're screwed up? Because I keep getting screwed up? Yeah, that's right. Okay, this time I mean it. I'm not going to get screwed up no more. And I wouldn't get screwed up. And then I'd get really screwed up because I ain't getting screwed up. And I'd have to go get screwed up because I'm so screwed up when I don't get screwed up. And then when I get screwed up, I really get screwed up. And some guy's saying, you know, you're really screwed up. And I go, yeah, I know. And that happened for years. 
And if you understood what I just said, you are an alcoholic because normal people just look at you like a deer in the headlight when you talk about, about that because it doesn't make sense to them because it looks to them like alcohol is our problem. Alcohol is not our problem. It never was. But if I stop working this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, what happens is alcohol starts coming on the radar again. And then it becomes the problem. What is the yearning and the obsession to drink? Is it really an obsession with the beverage alcohol? Or is it the obsession with the need for an effect? Is it the, isn't it the obsession with the need for the medicine that doesn't work anymore, hoping it'll work again? So this takes us down to the bottom of page 85. And I want to talk a little bit about step 11. This step was very, very confusing to me. One of my problems, I I have this kind of ego that is hideous. It's the kind of ego where I think I know stuff that I don't know. As a matter of fact, there have been times in my life I knew so much stuff that wasn't true, I had no room to learn anything new. I'm one of those kind of guys that that have a hard time asking for directions. Anybody like that here? Yeah, you just like you can't ask for help because you you think you need to know. And so I self-educate myself and and feed all this pomp and all this intellectual stuff because I don't want to ever look like I don't know. I want to be the guy who knows. So I, in early sobriety, I come to this part of the book on step 11 and I start reading it and it confuses me because it doesn't match my preconceived notion of what step 11 should be. And here's what it says. In italics, it says step 11. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than we are are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. It would be easy to be vague about this matter of prayer meditation. Yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. Okay, buckle up. I'm ready. I want the definite. I want you to tell me how to do step 11. And here's what it says. When we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do we owe an apology? Have we kept something to ourselves which should have been discussed with another person at once? Was I kind and loving towards all? What could I have done better? Was I thinking of myself most of the time, or was I thinking of what I could do for others? I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. This is not prayer and meditation. This is inventory. This is self-examination. This doesn't make any sense to me. Was this a misprint? Should this paragraph have been on the previous page? And it just confused me. And I just thought, and I read on further down the page, and at least down in the second paragraph, it talks about a couple prayers, but there's nothing in here that matches my view of meditation. I know about meditation. I had a mantra at one time, for God's sakes. I've chanted in Namne Yoho Orenge Kyo with the Buddhists. I've done the yoga, the breathing exercises. I've done the visualizations. I've done the, I've done all of that stuff. I know about, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, for God's sakes. I know about meditation. I've listened to Ravi Shankar, for God's sakes. I know about meditation. And nothing in here matches my preconceived notion of what meditation is. So I didn't follow the directions. I discarded them because the great I am knows stuff. And so what I went out is I went on a, a spiritual journey for my first 15 years or so of sobriety. And I want you to understand there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, it, matter of fact, further in the book it says, be quick, be quick to see where religious people are right. And so I started doing different chanting and I started, I went to different services, different places. I, 
I started, uh, I started doing some different meditation techniques. And, and it's all good in addition to, but not in substitution for. And that's the mistake I made. I, I didn't do it in addition to what it talks about on page 86 and 87. I threw this away and did all that stuff. And I'm about, I'm sober a while, like I don't, 15 or 17 years, I think. And a guy, a guy came to me who I sponsored who was sober a long time. And he said, I need some help with step 11. I don't know what to do. And by this time, I had done so many things, and they were, they were all good, but not, I couldn't really pick anything out and say, this is it. I didn't know what to tell the guy. I had done the, the prayer of St. Francis. I, I'd done a lot of stuff I, over the years. So I said to him, just as a throwaway line, I said, well, why don't you just do what it talks about in step 10 and 11 in the big book? And that son of a gun started doing it. He actually started doing it. He didn't question it. He just started doing what it talks about on page 86 and 87. And in no time at all, he's doing better than I am. And I hate that when that happens. I just, I just hate that. And, and so I started doing it. I figured, what the heck? I've done everything else. I started doing this. And after I'd been into it for a while, a guy I sponsor found a dictionary from 1913. I have one at home that I've, I found in a bookstore from, 1980, or from 1886. And I think the period from about 1890 through to about 1920, a dictionary anywhere in that time period in the English language would give you a pretty good view of the language as it existed at the time that Bill Wilson formed his language skills. And as we looked up the definition of the word meditation, I was astounded. And I realized that back in those days, it meant something different than what it meant today. Something happened in the English language in America in the 1960s and early 70s with the advent of the Beatles, J. Krishnamurti, Timothy Leary, Alan Watts, Aldous Huxley, some of the great teachers who had explored Eastern philosophies and brought them into Western culture, all of a sudden the definition of the word meditation started to take on new meaning. But the example that it used in 1913 was amazing. It said, a general will meditate a war. Now listen to this. On awakening... Let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. I could picture a general rising up early in the morning and looking out over his troops after he'd done what it talks about on the top of 86, after he had done an examination of his assets and liabilities. And calling, as it says in here, we ask God to divorce us from self-pity, dishonest, self-seeking motives. He's calling in his officers and he's saying, we have to divorce this day's march from these horses because they're lame. And these men are wounded. They must be pulled out of the army. They will not work. And these guns barrels are warped and these cannons are warped and we can't take them into today's march. They just won't work. Except in my case, it's not a battle against somebody else. It's a battle against self. And it's a battle against that propensity that is in me to run the show, to play God. And so I ask God, because I don't have the power to remove these from today's march. 
I ask God to divorce my thinking from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. In the 12 by 12, in step 11, there's a line that when I read it, all of a sudden I understood why this first paragraph on inventory was part of step 11. And it says in there that self-examination, meditation, and prayer, when taken separately, can bring much relief and benefit. And that's true. They can But then it goes on to say, but when they're logically related and interwoven, the result becomes an unshakable foundation for life. I don't need relief. I'm a relief junkie. I need something more important. I need freedom. Freedom from the bondage of self. And I believe that step 10 and 11 interlocked as a way of life is designed to do one thing and one thing only. And that's to better enable me to live a life of someone who is serious about this decision I made in step three. If I think that step 10 and 11 working together in my life is very similar to the tools that a sailor will use. If you were... <clears throat> If you were uh, to go down to the harbor and you were to buy the best sailboat money could buy, and you were to go to the nautical library and you were to chart a perfect course for, let's say, the island of, of, of Iceland, and no matter how diligent you were on the first nine steps of navigation, you're going to set out out of the harbor here and you're going to be perfectly on course for Iceland. But every single day, the winds and the tides and the currents are going to move you off course. It's not because you have a bad boat. It's not because you play with your tiller too much. It's just the way it is. Every single day, you're going to be moved off course a little bit. The ocean is not punishing you. It's just the way it is. And every single day, a sailor, in order to survive, will have to get out his sextant and compass, or maybe today it's his GPS, and take an honest, honest look at where he's going and where he is. And he can't fool it. The book says we can't fool ourselves about values. You can't be delusional. You're really, you're really somewhere over in Russia, but you think, why are the people in Iceland speaking Russian? You know, you can't, you can't delude yourself and, and try to wrap reality into making it match what you think or like would be. You have to be honest about yourself and say to yourself <clears throat> every day, I've been selfish today. I, I've been dishonest. I lied to those people. I, I, uh, I was thinking of myself most of the time. I wasn't really thinking about others. I wasn't kind and loving towards all. There is something I should have talked to another person about. I should have talked to my sponsor about this thing that happened at work. Now I don't want to go back to work. I feel uncomfortable. And I start to clear away the things that have pulled me off course so that I can get back on course. And one of the nice things it says here, and this has really been my experience, it says we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. This is not about beating yourself up for not being perfect. By the time you get to step 10, in your heart, there should be an acceptance of that you are imperfect. That you're going to get out of line every day. That fear is going to drive you off course. That you're no longer, that you're never going to ever once and for all have a perfect adherence to these principles. That we are not saints. But it's my job to realign my course. And what happens 
<clears throat> if I don't do that, is you can get so far out that you can't get back. And I have watched that over the years. I've watched guys that, that, that don't work with a sponsor because maybe they're five years sober and they're smart now. Right? They're smart guys. They don't need anybody to tell them what to do. They don't need accountability. I'm five years sober, for God's sakes. I'm a success. I don't need the accountability. And step 10 is, is fine for people who are really sick and get out of line. And I, I know God's there. I, I say I, I talk to him occasionally. That's enough for right now. And without ever realizing it, they're moving so far off course that they're not even in the same hemisphere anymore. And I've seen this, I bet you I've seen it two dozen times over the years. There'll be some guy who is backed away from AA, backed away from, he doesn't do step 10 to 11, he doesn't work with a sponsor. He's built a house of cards. A tremendous home and family and business, a big Big, robust life built on self. And then something happens. Maybe he catches his wife sleeping with someone else. Or maybe the tax guy comes and wants to start taking everything because he hasn't been paying all his taxes. Or maybe he has a big reversal in business and the whole house of cards starts to collapse. And then in a fear self-centered, fear-driven mode, he will be driven to an AA meeting, usually a discussion meeting. He will never go to a big book study or a speaker meeting at that point because he needs to share. And he'll run into this discussion meeting and the minute the chairman says, anybody have anything they need to talk about? His hand goes up. And he will dump on the room all of these problems that are just eating his lunch. As if he's expecting advice from the AA group. If you've ever tried to get advice from an AA group, it's like trying to take a drink of water from a fire hose. I mean, you'll sit there and all of a sudden everybody is sharing at you. And it's like, it's like eventually, you watch these guys about three quarters through the meeting, they can't take it anymore. They'll bolt out of the meeting and leave the meeting spinning on their problem. And some of those guys, they, they can't get back. They're too entrenched in themselves and their judgments and the things they want to be right about. Every, every friendly bit of advice is a threat to them because they're in charge. And the sad part is that they don't even know that that's what's going on. It looks to them like everybody around them is attacking them, whether they're trying to be helped or not. They've rendered themselves unhelpable. Too much self. The, what happens is, is I'll, I'll get too much of me between me and you that you can't help me. I'll get too much of me between me and God and God can't help me. I'll get too much of me between me and AA and AA can't help me. And I'm all alone. Lost at sea. And so I stay current with my sponsor I try to, on a regular basis, I, I don't know that I, I don't do it every day. I, I went through periods where I would do it every day. Now it's a little more sporadic. But I don't think there's, I don't think there's two, I don't think there's ever three days that go by where I don't take an inventory. Uh, I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable. But I'll tell you what I do do. The minute I start getting whacked, and I start getting really crazy. I get real serious. I just back in January, I was I took a little vacation, went over to Maui for a week, and I, I have some old members of AA that live over there, dear friends, and I uh, I went back through the steps four through nine while I was there, and I will do that periodically. And I, I, the reason I do that is that I I don't beat myself up for this. It's just who I am. And I am the person that is not going to be 100% diligent with step 10 and 11 every day. I'm just not. Now, if I'm real uncomfortable, I'll get pretty serious about inventory. 
But what happens to me, and I think this happens to a lot of us, it's, you're, there's some, th- you've been selfish and you've been a little dishonest over here and, and you've had a couple little resentments, but they're no big deal. It's night, you're retiring, you're going to bed, you just say, ah, it's okay. You sweep it under the bed and you go to sleep. It's so easy to do that. How many days do you go, how many nights have you gone to sleep and you've never stopped to find out if you've had a resentment? Or maybe you think to yourself, no, I'm fine. Do you realize that there's never been a day that you've been alive where you haven't been self-centered? Really? Could you imagine? I I, I hear people every once in a while meaning say, oh yeah, I'm no longer self-centered. I always want to look for the lobotomy scars. I mean, you know, how did you do that? I mean, I mean... I can't imagine that. Imagine going through a day and never being selfish, never being dishonest. That's uh, I just, not too long ago, I I caught myself in this, I catch myself in these lies all the time. I, I bought this car that my ego is overly fond of. Sometimes I feed the wrong dog, I'll tell you. And so, and, and within one day, I lied twice to two different people about what I paid for that car. And, the, and, and they were at both extremes. The one person I told I paid more than what I actually paid. I had to tell him the full sticker price. Oh, I didn't pay the full. I paid a lot less than that. And then the other guy, I told him about 10% below what I paid for it. And the one guy, I told him full sticker price because I, I, what, I did I was feeling vacant. And I wanted him to think I was a big shot. And the other guy, I told him I paid less than what I paid because I wanted him to think I'm smart and know how to get a good deal. But it's all self-grandizing stuff. And why am I I lying to these people? Because at that moment, I'm afraid. I am afraid that as is, I am not enough. That I have to enhance self in order to be even, right? So I try to make myself... And the minute, the minute you do that, you don't feel even. You feel phony. I mean, right? I didn't feel even. I felt like I, I felt... It was awful. But I'm not going to clean that up because I think they need to think those things. I... <laughs> See, the rationalizations never end. They never end. (laughs) Oh, man. A couple points and then I'm going to quit. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought or decision. We relax. We take it easy. We don't struggle. We are often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. If you relax. One of the meditations I did years ago was a prayer that I got off a friend of mine who was a a Franciscan. And it was a prayer that he told me that was used for uh, quadriplegics. And it was simply, it was called, I am the place. And I would just, every morning I would say to myself, I am the place where God shines through. Him and I are one, not two. I need not worry, fret, or plan. He wants me where and as I am. And if I be relaxed and free, he'll carry out his plan through me. And that would just, that's a nice prayer. Just a poem. It just centers me. See, I don't, I don't need God's will right now. Relax. Take it easy. Let it come to you like, like jets them on, floats them on a river. It always comes. It always comes if you take it easy. I fought the clock and I fought time all my life. It seemed like I lived on this edge of just wanting things. Nothing was coming quick enough for me. Quick enough for me. And I was always in a state of agitated conflict. And God's will does, does not come. There's a thing in the <clears throat> 12 by 12 in step 11. It says that we do receive guidance and direction from God in our lives just to the extent 
that we don't demand it in our way and in our time. Relax. Take it easy. Let the, the, it's, it talks in here about this sixth sense. This God consciousness. It talked on page 55 about the great reality deep down within me. I believe that I within me have a portal to the hard drive of the universe. To this power behind the whole thing. To whatever's behind this curtain. I think there's something inside of me that is locked right into that. The problem is, is that I keep blocking the channel between me and that thing. But everybody I know that have done this for a while have had those experiences of intuition where there's a small sense, a still small voice within you that occasionally, if you're quiet and you're not demanding and you're not in charge, comes through. And I, the hard thing for me is to follow that. Uh, because I talk myself out of it. I, I, in my business, years ago, I had an intuitive sense that would not go away about one of my employees, that there was something wrong with this employee. And it was kind of the, the sense was almost a reaction, like to get her out of there. But there was no logical reason to fire her. And so I started getting paranoid. I said, well, well maybe she, is she stealing or is she doing? And I had her checked a couple times, couldn't find anything. And I would not follow that instinct. By the time I finally let her go, I believed that she had stolen over $250,000 from me. But I would not trust that because I was afraid. I was afraid of making the wrong choice. I was afraid of, oh, you can't fire someone and ruin their life just on a feeling. I would not trust the God within me. I went to my sponsor. He said, get rid of her. Yeah, but I can't. God, what will people think? And uh, All those self-centered fears that blocked me. And how many times in my life have... If my, my, the God within me is trying to take me one way, but my ego and self-centered fears are blocking me from going down that road. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to refine here. But quickly, it says, what used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. And that's true. But I always check out my inspiration with people, with my sponsor. I tell the guys I sponsor, if, if you get a, an intuitive thought, call me. If you get a great inspiration, you better come and see me. <laughs> and it kind of warns us about that in the next couple sentences. It says, being still inexperienced, I'm 28 and a half years sober. I am still inexperienced. Being still inexperienced and have just... Having just made conscious contact with God, it is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Oh boy, you could write a book about absurd actions and ideas in AA. I mean, oh, I, I'll tell you one little quick story that I'm a, uh, we'll take a break. When I was, oh, this is, Quite a few years ago, probably 20, over 20 years ago, 20 some years ago, there was a guy named George who I believe is, is sober and living in Germany today. And I think he's sober 20 some years. But when George was new, when he was about two or three months sober, we're sitting around about five or six of us at a, at a coffee shop talking about AA. And we're talking about God. And George says to us, he says, you know, I really know now that God really loves me. And we all said, oh, good, George. How do you know that? He said, well, he said, God realized that I didn't have any self-esteem. So he put these three newcomer girls in my life to sleep with so I'd feel better about myself. <laughs> and we're doing like you're doing. We're cracking up. And we're, we think that's the most hilarious thing I've ever heard. And he doesn't know why we're laughing. He thinks, he believes that God is... T and what is that except the, the, the self-delusion that we all do 
Instead of trying to conform my will to God's, I start to delude myself that God has finally woken up and seen the truth. And I start imagining that He's conforming my will, His will to mine. As I revisited the, some of my childhood religion, I started thinking about the, the second commandment. And you know, I grew up thinking that the second commandment, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. I thought they meant don't cuss, don't say four-letter words. I, that's what I grew up being taught, pretty much. I thought that's what that commandment was about. Well, what would really, honestly, be the vainest way I could use God's name? Wouldn't it be to pray for my own agenda, my own will? Wouldn't that be the vainest thing I could ever do? Because there's a, there's a supposition in that if I'm saying, God, please remove so-and-so's cancer, or please let my tax audit go okay, or, or please help my friend get sober. Aren't I really saying to God, listen, God, I know you've been here a couple million years, and you've been doing all right, but Bob's here now, and, and I, I'm here to instruct you. Isn't that really what I'm saying? Aren't I presuming that I know better than God? It's why I think one of the most important words in all of the 12 steps is the word only in step 11. We pray only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry it out. I don't petition God for anything. I simply say, use me. Let's take a 7 minute and 36 second break. some requests so um, I oh, my booster seat's not here um, I had some requests about some things or some topics or some uh, things that people want me to elaborate on in my talk today um, things that you know I've mentioned over the past couple days that I do um, I've actually been doing something very different with steps 10 and 11 and 12 um, over the past couple years that have made a real difference in my recovery. Um, they're not something, they're something that I do because of who I am. Um, I don't, I don't say to people, oh, if you don't do it my way, you're not doing it right. What I say is that I'm very, very spiritually sick. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of dumb things if I'm not uh, connected with God in a very, very strong way. Because based on my own will, my own self, I'm going to be fearful, selfish, I'm going to behave badly, I'm going to manipulate, I'm going to get angry, resentful, and, you know, and I'm just not going to be the type of person that I want to be. And I've been taught a way to do steps 10, 11, and 12 that have made a big difference and have helped me to, you know, gain some level of real freedom in my life. Um, oh, my booster seat. Thank you. There we go. Um, Sucks being short, uh, uh, <laughs> but it's one of those things that we just need to accept. Uh, but I mean, the thing is, is and the reason why, like you know, I talk a lot about spiritual sickness when I talk. I don't talk so much about alcohol, you know, drinking. And I mean, I talk a little bit about it so you know that I'm an alcoholic. But the thing is, is you know, when you get sober at 18, how much drinking did I really do? Maybe six years. You know, I drank enough to know that I'm an alcoholic. I drank enough to know um, who I am, and I definitely drank enough to be here. But I tell you what, it's the, you know, we, you ever read the, to the wives and the family afterward and it talks about, uh, the different types of alcoholics. This is, you know, you have the type one alcoholic, you know, kind of take it or leave it, gets in a little bit of trouble. You know, you have the type two, he's getting a little worse. You know, people start getting mad at him. You know, he's a, sort of a binge drinker. Then you have type three who starts to go to rehabs and, you know, he's getting into some real trouble losing jobs and stuff. And then you have type, type four that's like committed. I'm kind of like a type 2, type 3 drinker and a type 5 spiritual malady. In fact, my own husband, who I love very, very much, you know, and tolerates me very well, very well, considering how um, demented I can be, 
um, says, I'm a type 5 alcoholic when it comes to spiritual malady. Because I've been sober for quite a while. But I have a progressive spiritual disease which will kick the living crap out of me on any given day. I mean, just kick my ass. And so... I talk a lot about the emptiness, a lot about the fear, a lot about the selfishness, a lot about those those things. You know, a lot about what my sponsor explains to me or explained to me that my alcoholism comes at me in uh hidden. You know, I don't fight alcohol anymore. You know, Bob talked a lot about that, about the 10-step promises and being safe and protected. I can go anywhere and do anything. When I talk about the 12-step, I'm going to talk to you about buying tequila for a sponsee and watching her drink it, because that's what we needed to do. That's a whole other story. But I'm safe and protected. I can walk into a liquor store. I can buy booze and not want to drink it, because God has relieved me of that. On the other hand, (laughs) alcohol doesn't come at me through bottles anymore. It comes at me through my ego. It comes at me through fear. It comes at me in that little voice that says, Carrie, they're all going to laugh at you. Carrie, you need that $300 pair of jeans, you know. Screw making that amends. You really need those jeans. They make you look skinny. Carrie, you know, it's not fair that your sponsees think you're mean. Carrie, it's not fair that your husband watches so much TV and is on the computer. Carrie, it's not fair... You know, and ad infinitum. My disease comes at me. My alcoholism comes at me that way. My alcoholism comes at me and says, Carrie, do you know how spiritual you are? You're a very spiritual girl. You meditate for two hours a day. You sponsor a lot of women. You rate a lot of four steps. You're very spiritual. You don't need to go to AA anymore. You graduated. You can go somewhere else. You know, that's how alcoholism talks to me. That's how alcohol talks to me. It hides. It hides behind my ego. It hides behind my fear. It hides behind self-centered fear. And those are the very things that will bring me back to the bottle. But see, I see the bottle coming now. I see the bottle and I say, no, that's bad. Don't go there. So alcohol has to be sneaky. And that's why in the 10 step it talks about it. It says, you know, I have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. So how is alcohol going to get me? It's going to get me on the basis of the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And I talk to you about hitting emotional bottoms in recovery. And then I've hit many of them. I've had many beautiful spiritual experiences that have transcended my life and I've forgotten about them just weeks and months later. You know, I, I've actually felt the presence of God run through my body. Within two years, I was back to being the same schmuck I was before I had that experience. Because what I've learned is that what I did for my sobriety today, yesterday does not guarantee me today. And that these spiritual experiences, although they're beautiful, I need to maintain them. You know, I don't like to talk about 10th and 11th and 12th step as maintenance steps, because I really hate that. Because I think it makes it seem like, you know, it's work, or you're treading water, or it, like it loses the spiritual momentum of these steps. What these steps, for me, are the broadening and deepening steps. They are the culmination of all the work that I've done thus far. You know, I spoke yesterday in the 6th and 7th step, and I said that, you know how to work the 6th and 7th step? 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. You ever want to really have a character defect be removed? Make amends for it a thousand times. You know, judgment, gossip. I've I've been a gossip or a judgmental and Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've had to go back to those that I've judged and make amends for those harms. You know, for gossip, how about gossiping? Make amends to the person you gossiped about, and then go make amends to everybody you gossiped to. You'll stop doing it. Sometimes. Well, you'll do it less, you know. And that's the point here, is that these steps for me are what, the way that I live my life. We talk about that design for living. 10, 11, and 12 is my design for living. It is my, it is what I do and how that I go through my day. It's how I have relationships with others. And it's how I avoid the bottle when it comes to me hidden and in, uh, you know, cloaked in, 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 in lies and fear. Because it does. It talks to me. And so I'm going to tell you about how I do. I have this thing called 10 Step Buddies. And I talked about it and I've hinted. And I hope that I have you sufficiently interested to find out what the heck this thing is.
It's really cool. It's like the coolest thing ever. In fact, I just did one like, what, five minutes ago? Um, what it is is this, is that when I'm disturbed or I'm frightened or I'm angry or I'm irritated or I'm, you know, blocked off from God, you know, we all know this. It says, you know, we watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear, right? So I go through my day and I watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. You know, your normal 10 step. But I follow the directions of the 10 step exactly to the letter. Exactly. So when I'm selfish, dishonest, resentful, or afraid, I stop. And I say, I'm selfish, dishonest, resentful, or afraid. What am I afraid of? What am I being selfish? What is, you know, where am I? And it's typically so-and-so. I'll give an example. My husband will love this. My husband's not behaving the way that I want him to, you know. Um, he uh, he didn't he didn't say that I I put on a dress and he, and I was like how do I look honey and he he's on the computer and he goes good and I'm like oh you're supposed to say you're the most beautiful creature I've ever seen can I marry you again you look good and then I go you didn't even look at me and he goes yes I did I'm like okay so Carrie gets selfish dishonest resentful afraid. My husband's not sufficiently worshiping me in the way that I'd like. Um, I'm dishonest because I believe that he should kneel at my feet because I'm a princess. I'm a princess who peed in the gutter, but I'm a princess nonetheless. So he should, he should grab my beautiful bejeweled slipper that he didn't buy me. And he should kiss the ground that I walk on. And I should, no matter how fat I get, be the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. Because I gave birth to his children, and so therefore I deserve to be worshipped. <laughs> I hear the, the, the dads laugh at that one. He owes me. Um, this is what goes on in my head. I'm, I'm not kidding. This is why I tell you, alcohol talks to me, and it talks to me through all kinds of crazy things. So, okay, so then I'm, I'm dishonest. And then I'm afraid. Because if he doesn't think that I'm pretty in this dress, maybe he thinks somebody else is pretty in another dress. Maybe there's some girl that he thinks is even prettier. Maybe he'll actually look up from the computer at another girl. Uh Uh-oh. Then I'm threatened. So then I stop. And I say, okay, instead of saying, how dare you not pay attention to me? I say, okay. God, this is what's going on in my heart and my head. I'm asking you to remove it. And then I do exactly what the 10 step says. It says, that we, it says that we discuss it with another person at once. At once. Immediately. At once. Not when I feel like it. Not three hours later. Not when it occurs to me to do it. Or when I run into somebody who's sufficiently perfect enough to do it. Because somebody who's spiritual enough to hear this beautiful opus of a resentment inventory that I have. At once. So that means sometimes if I'm on the bus, it means turning to the person next to me and say. I'm being selfish because I expect this bus to run on time. I'm dishonest because I'm playing God. And I don't think that, I think the world should run on my stopwatch. I'm asking God to, uh, or I have a fear of being late and therefore looking bad. I'm asking God to remove it. I'm telling you, is there anything I can be of service to you today? And they turn and they look at me like I'm a crazy kook. But that's normal on the bus. So they just, you know, okay. Well, she didn't spit on me, so all right. I've done this in the middle of class. I'm in, I'm in university, and I've turned to the person next to me and said, I'm afraid of failing my test. I'm in fear. I'm afraid. I'm being selfish because I want to control the situation. I didn't study enough. I'm being dishonest because I expect tests to be easy for me because I'm special. Because don't you know all the work I do in AA? I should get extra credit. You know, and then I say, you know, is there anything I could do to be of service to you? And they say, oh, can, well, can you give me the answers? Or can I have a pen? You know, but this is what I do. And this is what I do all the time. And when I don't, when I can't turn to the person next to me or if it's a, a doozy of a resentment, you know, I pick up the phone and I dial my sponsor. And I call, I, sometimes there are days when I call her five times a day. I mean, I have three kids and I have a very busy life and I'm pulling my hair out sometimes. And, you know, and I need to call her five times a day and I do five ten steps. You know, and she takes every single one of them because it takes one minute. Exactly what I explained to you. I'm selfish. I'm dishonest. I'm resentful and afraid. I ask God to remove it. 
I'm, I'm sharing it with you, and now I'm going to turn my attention to someone I can help. I'll cook dinner for my family. I'll meet with a sponsee. I'll call someone and say, hi, how are you doing? And then I go do that. It takes one minute. I've timed it on my cell phone. The longest one was one minute and 45 seconds. That's all. And I tell you what, you ever like walk through the day and like maybe you're in the office or maybe you're home and you're just in a mood and no one's behaving the way you want them to. And you keep stopping and pausing, you keep watching and you go right back there like, in, like, you have, like on a record and the needle's stuck in that groove and you just can't get out and you're just spinning and spinning and spinning. That used to happen to me all the time. I would behave well, but my mind was a sewer. You would think that I was the kindest, nicest little person in the world. And meanwhile, in my head, I was wishing you crucified and dead 35 times over. I'd be, you know, because, you know, I was stuck in that groove and I kept going back to it. And I kept going back to it. And I kept going back to it. And I couldn't ever get pulled out of that. And I found that this method of doing the 10th step and what I'm talking about works phenomenally. Now, not only do I have a sponsor, but I have a couple friends that are my 10 step buddies. And they call me. I hear these things. I hear there's some, you know, like I get calls like five, six times a day from them. And I just, you know, if I'm available and, you know, they call my cell phone, if, you know, my cell phone's turned off, obviously they call the next person on their list. And they call me and I hear, do you have time for a 10 step? Sure. My own sponsor does this with me. She does 10 steps with me just like I do it with her. That's what I said to you yesterday when I said that, you know, we walk shoulder to shoulder, that there are no authorities in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are people who have more experience. That's it. That doesn't make me an authority. That just makes me lucky because I got here before you. That's it. That's all. So my sponsor calls me. I'm resentful at my husband. He's not, who's a friend of mine, who's not behaving the way I want them to. And I listen. Because we don't go into the gossip. So she doesn't call me up and I don't call her up and saying, that bastard. How dare he? Because I'm not calling to spread my drama and my sickness. I'm calling to get out of it. Because you ever talk yourself, you ever do take, you ever take responsibility and, you know, you're sitting there and you're doing an inventory, you're, you're doing a 10 step and you're talking to somebody, maybe you're talking to your sponsor, you know, and maybe you had a really big resentment that day and you wrote out a four column resentment inventory, which I do when I have a big resentment, along with doing a written nightly review, which I will get to. Um, I'm really anal when it comes to the steps. I'm very anal. You don't have to be. But, you know, if you're sick as me, you have to be. Um, so you ever like to, you ever do a, a, a resentment inventory on something that's bugging you? And by the time you're done, you write that inventory, maybe you share it with somebody, you call your sponsor up with it. And by the time you're done and you're in your fourth column, you've talked yourself back into your second column and you're pissed off again. You ever do that? You know, I call it the turnaround. That I've taken responsibility, or what I think is responsibility, but I'm still pissed off, and I'm still in the emotion of it, and I'm still seeing red. And so I intellectually know where I'm at fault, but emotionally I'm not willing to let go of my right to be right, and I talk myself right back into that second column. See, when I do a 10-step, I'm not allowed to do that, because I'm not allowed to tell my sponsor, well, I mean, obviously when I come to her for guidance, say, you know, Kim, I don't know how to handle this situation. What do you suggest? And she usually tells me, write inventory, pray, and call me back. But, but I don't call her up saying, oh, so-and-so did this. I call her up saying, so-and-so is not behaving the way I want them to. Because in the end, that's really what, the, what my resentment's about. My resentment isn't about what you did, but, but what I want you to do and what you're not doing. You know, because if I know that, and this is something that I was talking with somebody yesterday about, it's like, I have this habit. Like, I'll just walk up to somebody, anybody, and I'll be like, I love you. I'm going to invite you into my house. I'm going to give you a big hug. I'm going to be lovey, 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 lovey. Please love me because I love you. And then I don't, like, stop to think, well, gee, who is, it, who is this person? You know, was it a smart thing to tell them where I live? You know, or was it a smart thing to let them into my into my innermost heart? You know, we can love everybody, but we don't have to get attached to everybody. You know what I'm talking about? I have a habit of getting attached to people who cannot or will not be emotionally available to me. It's this, like, silly, crazy thing that I do, you know, where I, I get attached to people who cannot be available to me, and then when 
they're not available to me, I get mad at them, even though I totally knew that they weren't available to me because I've seen them in their life and I totally know that I'm not special. But I think that I am because I think I'll win you over so that you, so, you know, I can prove to you I'll be really nice to you and you'll be emotionally available to me and you're not. You ever do that? Yeah. The women know. We know. This is our, this is our bag, baby. This is how our spiritual sickness is, expresses itself. Yeah. Um, Part of, part of doing this work is really seeing these expectations, seeing this sickness play itself out. And part of the reason why I do the 10 steps the way that I do is so I don't go there. It's a way that God can come into my life and edit it as I go through my day. I also stop. I told you yesterday I talked about the set-aside prayer when I was yelling at somebody. And I was talking about it, and I said, uh, during the question and answers, I said that, you know, I stop five, ten times a day, and I say the quick set-aside prayer. I ask God to help me to set aside everything I think I know and ask God to please show me what blocks me off from him and my fellows. You know, I, I read pages 86 to 88 every day. From this thought, bring, thought brings me to step 10 to the end of the 11th step. It's part of my prayer and meditation. I sit quiet once a day, forever, however long. I mean, I have a 10-month-old, so it used to be that I sat quiet for about 45 minutes. Now I'm averaging about 20, and I figure my sponsor says that it's okay. <laughs> She's like, it's all right, Carrie. You know, because I have to be a spiritual giant, so I meditate longer than you. If you meditate 20 minutes, I meditate 25. If you meditate 50 minutes, I meditate 55 minutes, because, you know, I have to be more spiritual than everyone else and compete. You know, so my, I, my, uh, I realized that, uh, you know, that meditating for 45 minutes was causing, was causing chaos in my life because I had to wake up so, so much earlier to do it before I got my kids ready for school. And when you have a newborn and you're feeding them all the time and you're not sleeping but three hours a night, they end up having a grumpy mom. And that extra 20 minutes of sleep makes a big difference. So for me, it, I had to be willing to meditate less to be more effective in my life, if that makes any sense to you. And that what I'm talking about is not being attached to the... I, I've heard somebody say it, and he's one of my favorite people. He talks, about not, uh, he talks about not being attached to the mountain which you ride. Talks about He says that, you know, like we're riding a donkey, you know, to God. And that, you know, I need to not be attached to that donkey. That it's the destination, the God, the getting close to God that is the real goal here and not how I do it. Because how we do it is individual for each one of us, you know. And it's another, the old saying is like, don't mistake the finger pointing for the, to the moon for the moon. It's the same idea. That, you know, for me, how I meditate, what I do, my 10 and 11 step, the steps themselves, my sponsor, the direction, and all those things, that's the finger pointing to the moon. But my ultimate goal or what I really want to gain contact with isn't with that finger, but with the moon itself. Because my sponsor's as fallible as I am. My sponsees know I'm very, very fallible because I do 10 steps with them. I call them up and I do the same thing. So they understand, they see my clay feet just like I see my sponsors. Um, but you know, the, I also trust her guidance implicitly. I respect her. And I know that if she tells me something about myself, she asks me to consider something or she gives me direction, I know that she has what's best for me in mind. Doesn't mean that I might take something in meditation. It may not be true. She might say, Carrie, can you consider that, you know, in this situation, you know, you're being X, Y, and Z. And I'll say, okay, Kim, I'll think about that. And I'll take it into meditation. And it turns out I'm A, B, and C. That I'm still being bad, but just not in the way that she suggested that I might be. So I might come to her and I say, Kim, you know, I took it into meditation, but I think this is more the problem. I'm more attached to this. She says, okay, we'll keep meditating with it. You know, so it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that everything she says about me or everything she says is always accurate. But what it is, is that I know that if she says something, I really need to consider whether or not it's true. Because it's probably very, in the time that I've worked with her, it's been twice where I've said, you know, I don't know if I agree with that. You know, that's a pretty good track record, you know. And she's the type of person who doesn't have to fight for her right to be right. So she says, okay. You know, it doesn't mean that I'm a perfect, though, because sometimes, like, my my, uh, my sponsor likes to tease me, and she says all the time, she says that I, um, I'm a fighter. Because she'll, t- you know, sometimes when there's definitely, when I'm stuck in myself where I don't see things or I don't want to see something, she'll bring something to my attention. My first instinct is, like, no, screw you. 
you know, and I have to hold on to that and stop and pause and ask God to open my, you know, so I might say to her, like, Kim, can I pray for a second before you finish what you're saying? And I'll pause right there, just like, you know, we talk about in the 10th step. And I ask God to help me to have sanity. And then I listen to what she has to say. And I say, okay. You know, the, the two most beautiful, the one, two most beautiful words, the two most beautiful letters in the, the alphabet are O and K. Okay. And the other thing I love is whatever. Not in the snotty, oh, whatever, you know, like, you know, but whatever. Just, okay, whatever, man. You know, my, so when my sponsor says something to me, it's okay. I may not like it, I may not agree with it, but I love her. Okay. And I gotta tell you something. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had no idea how to rely and depend upon a hot power greater than myself. You know, I talked to you about my war with God and my resentment with God and my resentment with the world and my resentment with my parents and my hatred of everyone around me because they, I felt they hurt me. And to trust any one person with guidance, with my life, with my fist step, to, 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 to have them be a part of my daily life and not some place I visit on vacation, but to have that intimacy was the scariest thing for me, especially with a woman. Oh, see, men I can, I can manipulate. And, you know, men are real easy to, to wrap around your little finger. I'm sorry, guys, but you, you know, you're a little dumb. You know? So I'll, you know, I'll tell men anything. Oh, yeah, cause I can, I can even you know, pat your little eyes. You know, like, I'll think I'm taking responsibility. It's like, oh, I'm gonna do a 10 step with so and so. And then I tell him and I pat my little eyes. I'm like, oh, you poor thing. Oh, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Pat, pat on the head. Here's a cookie. You tell women, they're like, oh, really? Huh? Let's talk about that. You know, and you get a boot up your ass instead of a cookie and a pat. You know, so to trust a woman and to really open my life up to her and be willing to do this with her, call her on a regular basis every day, call her with my nightly review, open my life up and to do that and to have that with her, that constant thing. She, I don't fart without her knowing about it. And not because she's controlling, but because I know it's what's best for me. To have that is a really scary thing for somebody like me. Because I'm terrified of you. I'm terrified of you knowing me and running screaming for me. And the fact is I can call that woman 57 times a day with a 10 step and she would love me the same as the day before when I called her with one. She loves me no matter what I do. Just like I was taught to love the women I sponsor no matter what I do. You know, my sponsees, let me just quickly, I have 10 minutes. I don't want to go over. You guys are definitely hungry and you've been very patient this morning and this weekend. So I'm going to try to be as concise, but as to give as much information as possible. Um, I write out my nightly review as well. So I have a pad and I answer those 12 questions. You know, I love, I love it. You know, I, my big book opens automatically to these pages. You know, when I retire at night, I constructively review my day, not deconstructively. I don't beat the crap out of myself. Where was I resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? So all those 10 steps I did during the day, if they're not on my nightly review, my sponsor's going to know about it. I'm going to know about it. Um, where do I, do I owe an apology? Have I kept something to myself? So did I not do a 10 step? Sometimes I'll tell you what, I'm asleep and I don't even realize that I was disturbed or something bugged me or I rationalize it in my head and then I sit down to do a review and I realize that there were a couple phone calls I should have made because I had a day in which I thought that I can think my way through my life. And I take responsibility for that. So I say to my sponsor, no, I didn't do 10 steps or didn't do enough, or I skipped one because I was busy. I was busy. I had things to do. You know, God invented... Cell phones are the most beautiful thing. You know? I mean, that's the cool thing, is I can be running out the door, and I can be I can be disturbed, and I can pick up that phone, and I can call my sponsor. I can call the list on there. I can call anybody, turn to somebody on the bus. I can... We live in a world in which we do not come into, not come into contact with people. We have the internet, email. I mean, there is no way I could avoid doing a 10-step other than the fact that I don't want to do it. You know, so did I do a 10-step? Did I Was I disturbed and not do it? Was I kind and loving to, to all? Well, that answer is always no. I, it's very rare that I have a day where I was kind and loving to all because there's very rare that, that I have a day where I haven't done a 10-step. 
I've been doing them all weekend, man. Um, what could I have done better? So then I think, well, what could I have done better in my day? Well, in those 10 steps, what could I have done better? What could I have taken in, you know, how could I have behaved? Usually the, the, the pat answer is always pray, pause, and rely on God. And then whatever action I should have taken instead of the action I did, which is, you know, yell, scream, cry, throw a fit, throw things, you know, or seethe the silent scorn. We love, I love that one. The, I'm really mad at you, but I'm not going to let you know, so I'm just going to, you know, just pout in a corner, you know. So what should I have done instead, you know? And then um, what, what could I have done, um, what could I have done better? Was I thinking about myself most of the time? Yeah. Even when I'm helping people, I'm thinking, what is she, when is she going to be done with this fifth step? Oh, I'm tired. You know. And then I pause and pray, or I do a ten step right there. I've stopped in the middle of the ten step, and I said, look, um, can I do a, ten, or a fifth step? And I said, can I do a ten step with you? I'm being selfish because I really want you to finish. <laughs> I'm being dishonest, and blah, blah, blah. And I'll do that, and they'll, they'll, we'll laugh together. Because this is the thing, is like they know that I'm sitting there and sometimes I'm not present. I, there have been a, multiple times when I'm doing step work with somebody or I'm here at a fist step and I'll stop and be like, look, I'm, I'm full at the moment. Can we stop? Can we get a cup of coffee? Can we you know, just take a five minute walk? You know, instead of pretending that I'm so spiritual, I can listen to eight hours of a fist step. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a spiritual giant. I can take it. If you can dish it, I can take it. I'll stop and be like, can we get a cup of coffee? Can, you know, can we just take a, get a fresh breath of air, you know, brush of fresh, fresh air? Oh, I can't talk this morning. And, you know, go back to it. And, you know, admitting that to my sponsees gives them the license and makes them willing to talk to me about the things going on in their life. Because they're not afraid of my judgment because they know that I'm just like them. Um, so was I thinking of what I could do for others? That answer is... I, I, my sponsor tells me that I can't answer it half and half. There's no percentages. I used to do percentages on my nightly review. Well, I thought about myself 50% of the time. And she's like, look, no percentages. It's either yes or no. So that answer is usually not enough. <laughs> you know? So the answer is usually no. It doesn't mean that I go through my day and I never think of other people. In fact, I try to live my life of service. I try to live my life where, I, where my constant thought of others and how I can help meet their needs. But do I fail miserably? Yeah. Do I think enough about other people? No. I don't. Because I don't, I'm a human being and I'm not capable of that perfection. But I try. And fail miserably. And what are my constructive measures? Do I owe an amends? You know, is there something I need to take into meditation? Is there, a rev- is there an inventory I need to write? Is there something I need to do? And then I call my sponsor up with it. You know how long it takes to read that? Roughly four minutes. I've timed it on the average. Sometimes two. Depends on how bad a day it was. So roughly, if you think of it an average day for me, my nightly review, my 10 step takes me almost eight minutes. I average about four 10 steps a day because I am not perfect. I've gone days where I haven't had to do any. I get those about once a week. Yesterday was a day when I really didn't have a lot of 10 steps. Today, Yesterday was a very clean day. I had one. Um, today I've had one, and it's only 11, so, like, Lord knows what the hell I'm going to do for the rest of the day. Um, but my thing is, is this, is that roughly it takes me eight minutes to do this. Eight minutes out of 24 hours that I'm free. 24 hours that I'm way more effective, that I'm not blocked by myself, that I'm not in my own way, and where I'm of service to God, where I'm present for my kids, they know that their mom is home, that their not mom is not spinning in her head, thinking about all the other problems going on in her life, that I'm not there when I'm playing Legos with my son or at his baseball game. They, you know, this is the beauty of this, this, this process. I know it sounds very laborious in the way that I explain it, but it's eight minutes a day. You average in the meditation for, it takes me about a half hour a day. And I live a life of freedom and of service. A life where I can really be okay in my own skin and feel safe. You know, and I have four minutes to talk about the 12th step, which, you know what, when we do the, when we do the family afterward, I use that chapter in my, in my uh, 12th step and how I sponsor. 
So you're also you're going to hear a lot about how I sponsor in when I come back here. So I'm just going to give you a little bit. I, and as, obviously, as I talk, I've been talking to you about the 12 step. I tell you how I apply it with the sponsees, and you know how I hear fist steps. And one of the things, and this is something that I think is extremely important. I think that, and uh, Bob touched on this as well. Some of us. I have been guilty of this, have lost sight of the, my 12th step. There are times when I feel like I'm too busy to help the newcomer. I, th- I remembered like a couple months ago, I was really tired. My son was teething and I hadn't slept in a couple days. And I was laying in my bed and I had decided that I was going to ditch home group. You know, I, I have a commitment there. I was a secretary, but I, I got somebody to cover it. And I'm laying in bed. And I'm thinking, I'm really tired. And I had, I had heard a fist step earlier that day as well. So I hadn't slept in a couple days, and I had heard a fist step. I was really punchy. And I was laying in bed, and I said, you know, I'm really tired. I don't need to go to so many meetings. This is what's going on in my head. <sighs> you know, I do a lot of 12-step work. You know, I probably shouldn't take on any new sponsees. You know, you know what, you know what? I don't want to go to Denmark. It's really far away. It's going to take a lot of time. I've got to go back and take a bunch of tests when I come back. You know, the day after I land, I have like exams and two papers due. You know, I don't think I need to go to AA anymore. Took about 60 seconds. I shot, shot bolt up and said, holy shit. Picked up the phone, called my sponsor, 10 stepped and walked out the door in my pajamas and went to home group. You know, so my ego can ease me back out of the door, and I begin to think I don't need to do this 12 step. And when I was there, there were three newcomers that w- that were there that night that I needed to help, because us women, as big book thumpers, as people who do the steps and have had a spiritual awakening, we're a rare breed. Not so much in this room, which I am really heartened for. It's like awesome to see so many women who are sitting here. Usually, there's like five women and a bunch of men. You know. Uh, I said, this is awesome. But in America especially, there's not a lot of women. We're a rare breed. You know, and so we have a responsibility to show up and to sponsor. I can't sit on my fat ass because there's not going to be anybody else who's going to step up to that plate. Because there's not a lot of women who have been lucky enough to have this experience. You know, in, in New Jersey, there's my sponsor... My old sponsor, Cass, who actually just moved, so she's not even in Jersey anymore, I'm sorry. Her sponsees, and two other women who are very good friends of mine, who are, who have over a decade of working the steps. That's it. And I know that doesn't say, you know, I know that sounds pretty good, but we got a millions of people in Jersey. It's a big place. And there's a lot of meetings. There's like, the, it, just in North Jersey alone, there are 12,000 meetings. There's 12,000 meetings with newcomers walking in, and there are only five to six women with over a decade of working the 12 steps. And unfortunately, I'm one of them. And that's really sad if you've got to go to me. You know, think about that. That's a real sad state of things, man. You know, and none of us have over 20 years. That's really sad. That's the saddest goddamn thing I have ever heard. You know, so as a woman, I have a responsibility. I, I, and I've been tossed out of meetings. I've had people tell, and I, I you know what? I, I, I look at it this way. Maybe when I get older, I'm not going to be able to do this, but I'm 30. I'm from Jersey. I'm an Irish woman. I'm a brat. So I feel like I can get away with it. But I've said to people, like, how dare you sit at home when there are alcoholics dying? How dare you? That's like telling God, thank you very much for the gift of life, but screw you. I mean, frankly, and my sponsee, I had a sponsee who called me a couple months ago, and she was like, you know, I haven't been to a meeting in three weeks, and I'm not going anymore. And she got a boot so far up her ass, it came out her mouth. I was like, how dare you? And I yelled at her for, well, I didn't yell, but I talked very animatedly for about ten minutes. And she said, you're right. And she went. You know, because it's been my experience and I have been taught that it is incredibly selfish of me to take my ball and go home. That yes, it, it's hard working with newcomers. It's hard doing this thing. You have to have a lot of patience and tolerance. You hear a lot of crazy stuff. 
You know, you get, get a lot of midnight, three o'clock in the morning phone calls. And when you're with, like me and you don't get a lot of sleep, I mean, they suck sometimes. You hear a lot of fist steps. You do a lot of, and you will have people who you will sponsor for years who will decide, who will go out and drink. You'll have people that will sponsor for years who will decide that you're a complete ass and go around telling everybody about it and you have to sit quiet because you're not allowed to defend yourself like my sponsor taught me because you don't defend yourself against gossip because then you're participating in it. So you sit quietly and somebody says, so-and-so says that you're a mean, horrible, blah, 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 and you do this and you do that and do this. And I want to say, well, yeah, that's because I told her to stop sleeping with newcomers. But I can't do that. So I sit quietly and say, Really? Well, if you have any questions about that circumstance, I think you should talk to her. And then I call my sponsor and do a 10-step. <laughs> but I have to be willing to take egg on my face because I have to be willing to step up to the plate and say the uncomfortable things. My job is to disturb people about their question of alcoholism, just like it's my sponsor's job to do it for me. I am not here to make you comfortable because it's seeking comfort that freaking almost killed me. So it is my job to be willing to look bad, to have you hate me because I love you more than I need you to like me. So I say the mean things and I say the abrasive stuff and I'll, I'm loving about it and I will, I will give you a boot in the ass and a hug and a cookie at the same time because I learned you can't just give a boot in the ass and send them out the door because then they won't come back. But I, they, you know, my sponsees, I will, I, will, I will say I love you very much. Can you consider this? Let me give you a hug after you're done crying. You know? But that's what my sponsor does for me. You know, because women, we are light. We, I don't know about you. I've met a couple women who are really, really hardcore. My sponsor's very hardcore. And I, there's some people in Vegas who are apparently pretty hardcore. But I, a lot of times in my, in my area, women are very light because they're afraid of pissing people off. They're afraid of driving newcomers out the door. And so they're very, very gentle. And they say, gee, honey, it's okay. You know, it's okay that you're doing that. It's okay that you're stealing. You know, you can continue to be a prostitute and stay sober. And in America, that's, like, not real cool. And I know it's legal here, but in America, it's breaking the law. So, like, there's a whole thing about breaking the law and staying sober. It doesn't always work. Um, you know, it's okay, honey, to cheat on your husband. It's okay. No. We don't arbiter anybody's sex conduct, but I am not going to love you so much then I'm going to false love you, then I'm going to love you till you drink. You know, there's a guy that I respect very much, and I'm going to end with this. I did go over I'm sorry, guys. He talks about, he says, honesty without compassion is cruelty. But compassion without honesty is an injustice. I have to have both. And that doesn't mean that I, you know, my sponsees will tell you I'm a hardcore bitch. On the other hand, they know that I will sit with them for hours while they're crying and hold their hands. That I will make them dinner. That they are welcome at my house at any time. They can call any time and I will listen. But if I listen, you have to be willing to hear what I have to say about what you just said. That's our agreement. But they know that I will go to bat for them. But my sponsor taught me this. She said that she will only meet me halfway and she's only willing to put the amount of effort into our relationship that I'm willing to put. So if I don't show up, I ain't going to get what she has. And she's not going to make me do it. And I do that with my sponsees. If they stop calling me because they stop calling me, I call them three or four times. I call them once a month just to tweak their nose, just to annoy them, to let them know I'm still there. And when they're ready to call me, they will. And sometimes they drink. Sometimes they do other things. And they come back because they know that no matter what, I will, I will always o welcome them with open arms. I've had people who have left working with me, have said horrible things about me that were completely inaccurate in my mind. Of course, they probably were very accurate in theirs. And then months later, they drank and they called me up and they've said, you know, Kara, can you help me? And I didn't say, well, only if you go around and tell everybody that you said mean things about me to, you know, you can take it back, then I'll help you. I said, of course I'll help you because I realized that it wasn't about me. That it's not about my respon it's not about my reputation, it's not about how I look, it's about my responsibility to show up for God. I had a response, you know, and this who stole my engagement ring when I was helping her. And years later she contacted me and she wanted help. And I said to my sponsor, I was like, I don't want to freaking help her. She stole my engagement ring. And she he, she, she said, If you don't help her, don't you dare call me tomorrow. 
How many engagement rings did you steal? How many things did you steal? And if somebody, I came to AA and I lied and cried and people took care of me when I sucked every little bit of marrow out of, ki- of kindness out of these people and they never shunned me. How dare I do that to her? And I, and I did help her. Unfortunately, she ended up h- hanging herself in her mother's basement a couple years ago. But she knew that I loved her and that there was nothing that she can do that would make me not love her. You know, this is what this is about, folks. They're going to burn your mattresses. They're going to call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. They're going to steal your shit. They're going to say mean things about you. They're not going to love you all the time. But it is my responsibility to give back what I've been given because I did the exact same thing to to other people. You know, and this is just my experience. And I want to thank you for being patient, for having me go over. And I hope you guys have a good lunch, and I'll talk to you a little later. Thank you. I'm Bob, an alcoholic. We're going to kind of go back and forth and each comment. Why don't you stand up here so we can, we'll just kind of go back and forth. Uh, First question, why are Icelandic people more spiritual than Danish people? (laughs) Arner. (laughs) That's not really a question. I'm just kidding. Uh, Here's a good question. It says, all this talk about being self-centered, not doing for me, but for others. How can I be helpful to others? How do you know it's not it's God's will or codependency? Still trying to people please to fix me from the outside. You know what I've, what I've discovered is that if it has to do with, if, if you can attach the word your to it, hmm. It's probably not altruistic. In other words, if it has to do with your relationship or your family or your children or your friends, it's an element of self. Mm. Real altruistic uh, agape love is about helping others for no reason at all. That's one of the one of the ways that a guy like me who's very self-centered learns how to love and to be free of myself is to go out there and help people who can't do anything for me. Mm-hmm. They will, it will never serve self to help them. They're never going to give me any credit for anything. They can't get me a better job. I'm not going to sleep with them. I'm, there's nothing there that gratifies or does anything for me and there's no reason to help them or do anything or even love them except in the process of doing that I will learn how to love mm-hmm. without serving self. You want to comment on that? Sure. Have you guys ever heard of something called the four absolutes? I love the four absolutes. With any given circumstance or a relationship, I try to take these four principles and ask myself, you know, absolute, absolute love, absolute honesty, absolute unselfishness, and absolute purity. So it's saying here, how do I know that I'm not in codependency? Well, the fact is, is, is if I'm looking at a circumstance or relationship, and I'm not practicing those absolutes to some degree, then I'm in codependency. I'm in self. You know, so when, I, when I'm looking at a circumstance and I say, well, how should Carrie behave? Carrie should be kind. Carrie should be loving. Her motives should be pure. should be unselfish. I should be honest. If I, Bob said it perfectly yesterday when he says, if I have to explain or defend. You know, my sponsor taught me. She said, Carrie, yes and no are one word sentences. There is no explanation needed. So, but if I'm explaining in my head, I'm probably attached to the outcome. And I love it. That, you know, the big book in the back, you know, it depends on your, the edition you have and obviously the language it's in, but there's the Dr. Addict Alcoholic, or now the newly titled Acceptance is the Answer. And it has this passage that talks about acceptance. It says acceptance, you know, is uh, an answer to all my problems today. And in those passages, it talks about not being attached to the outcome that I go into situations and I try to bring honesty, unselfish, love, kindness, tolerance, 
And I try not to be attached to how you receive that. To just bring it. If you receive it and you love me back, wonderful. If I bring love just for the pure sake of bringing love, wonderful. Then I grow spiritually. So for me, in these circumstances, applying the four absolutes, really checking my motives. If I'm overanalyzing justification, rationalization, and just really being honest with myself about any given circumstance, and asking God to show me the truth, I tend to be able to see the truth. The bottom line is, if you think you're being codependent, you probably are. Because when you're loving, you're not thinking about how other people are receiving your love. You're just giving it. Just like a baby gives you a smile just because. Anyway, that's my experience. My, my sponsor is not an advocate of alcoholics going to Al-Anon or CODA or ACOA. And he is one that believes that if an alcoholic is going to another one of those 12-step programs, it's because he, there's something he doesn't want to do in his own program. And what I've discovered is a lot of guys that I've sponsored that wanted to go to CODA or Al-Anon, it's really because they do not want to surrender their relationships completely. They want to go there trying to find a way to manage them, trying to get information, as if it's from addition, but it's really a matter of letting go. And if you don't, if you don't, if you want to learn tricks on how to better manage a relationship, that would be the natural place. That's where I would go. Uh, you know, if I don't want to surrender it. Uh, next question. If I don't believe in God or a higher power, what can I do, for example, step two and three? I, I don't know that you have to believe in God. I think there's a line in our book. It says that we, it says before we ever come to believe in God, I think you believe in God later. Like maybe somewhere in between step five and step nine or some, even maybe even up into 10 or 11 where you really start to know the presence of God. Uh, I think all you have to do is you have to believe in the hopeless futility and hopelessness of your condition. In other words, if you just get that you're, you are toast, if you just get that you are hopeless, if you just get, and I think this power in this universe, whatever it is, deplores a vacuum. And if you just get that you can't, maybe you'll find something that can. You want to comment on that? Well, what I do with the women that I work with when they have, a tr- they have trouble believing in God or a higher power. Oh, sorry, I have to get closer to the, mo- the mic. Um, stand on my tippy toes. Um, when the women that I sponsor are having trouble believing in a higher power, for one, you know, Bob is absolutely correct that the, that the steps don't require that. They just require a willingness. Um, what I tell them is, do you believe that this process works? Can this process, the 12 steps, be a higher power to you? If you believe in spiritual principles and the spiritual principles of this program, are you willing to submit to the process, follow the directions, and find out what happens? To me, it's a very simple bet. The life the way that I've been living it has been very unsuccessful. Other people in AA who work the 12 steps get better. What are my odds? Well, if I continue to do what I'm doing, I'll die an alcoholic death. That kind of sucks. I can work the 12 steps, and I might, just might, on the outside chance, experience what they experience. So really, the first time, and honestly, the first time I went through the steps, I didn't believe in God. I hated God. I wasn't giving God anything. But what I was willing to do was to believe that this step process worked. And that willingness to believe in this process opened me up to a higher power. So good orderly direction is a beautiful thing. Thank you for letting me share. Uh, This is an interesting question. Bob, what will it help AA if celebrities, if celebrity Britney Spears got recovered in AA? Um, Well, I know a whole bunch of guys that are waiting to sponsor her. I don't know how spiritual that'll be. Um, I'll tell you something I've observed. You know, in, living in Las Vegas, uh, we see some of this. 
You see it more in places like California and New York, where uh, very famous people will come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll tell you, they have a tough time recovering, and it's, it's our fault. Because we won't allow them to be another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. We treat them special. They get sponsors that will not expect or demand the same thing from them that they would from other people because they're, they don't, we don't want to hurt Brittany's feelings. Besides, she might get another sponsor and then how would I look? Uh, you know, we treat them different. I've, I've uh, heard stories of, of people coming into meetings that are brand new. They're dying of alcoholism. They're very famous people. And people come up and want to give them scripts, you know, for if th if things, plays they've written, and they want to uh, offer them business deals, and they, they want to get their autograph. And those people never have a chance. Mm -hmm. I think this, I think we have a responsibility of, of as members of Alcoholics Anonymous, not to treat anyone here any differently. That this, in the back of the book, in the medical view of alcoholism, one of the doctors talks about one of the powers of Alcoholics Anonymous is it plays not only on the force, the spiritual force found in religion, but also on the herd instinct. That we must always be part of a herd. That's all we are here. I'll tell you something I, I think is dangerous in AA. I think getting up here and doing what we're doing is dangerous. I think it feeds something that should be starved. Yep. And the only way I think guys like me are able to get away with this without uh, imploding on our own wonderfulness is, is that I, I stay in the trenches. I go down to... Uh, skid Row a couple times a week and I work with the, the lowest of the low. I go into jails. I go into a jail meeting once a week. I have a sponsor that will keep me right size because every time I just start to puff up at all, he's always shooting me down. Just, I mean, just bring, and it's not, it's not out of, what he's doing is bringing me back to reality. Reality. That I'm a guy who has, a, I'm, I'm under a death sentence here. And the worst, I've watched guys in Alcoholics Anonymous, some of them are not alive anymore, some of them are drinking again, who became, who allowed what th people said about them in the fellowship to go to their head and they started to believe it. Because they spoke a lot and they helped a lot of people. It's very, very dangerous. This should always be principles before personalities. Before my personality. That's the only personality here that's out to get me, is mine. Uh, want to comment on that? You actually went exactly where I wanted to go. Um, you know, I was going to ask anybody to consider whether or not they treat other people special in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, you know, my sponsor has this thing where she asked me to be honest with her. She has some, we have something called, you ever, it's called spiritual license. And it means that if I see my sponsor about to trip, that I have a responsibility as a fellow, fellow member of Alcoholics Anonymous to say, can you consider that there's a rock in front of you? You know, and my sponsees have the same. That my sponsees know that I'm human, that I have clay feet, that I am not perfect, and I never claim to be. And that they have a responsibility as fellow children of God if they see me about to do something really dumb to point out to me, Carrie, can you consider that's not a bright idea to do? You know, and, th and it's something that a friend of mine talked to me about. I had this friend who was over 20 years sober, and um, he got sober about the same age as I did, and we got along very well. And he spoke all kinds of places, and he was a big shot. And he was slowly dying an alcoholic death, and all the rest of us around him were afraid to say, you know, I don't think you're right about that. Like, maybe that, you know, that's not a justifiable resentment. Can you consider? And we were all scared because this guy's the authority. He's the big deal. He's the show. And he almost drank. And when he was dying an alcoholic death, depressed and miserable in Alcoholics Anonymous, I went up to him one day and I said, what's wrong? And he goes, no, none of you guys really love me.
You come to me, you ask me for advice, you come to me, you ask me what I need to do, you know, you share your problems with me, but nobody except for you, Carrie, has ever asked me how I'm doing. And I only asked because he looked like he was about to cry. It wasn't because I'm virtuous, it just happened to notice that day. And I realized how incredibly selfish I was by treating him like an inexhaustible resource instead of a human being. You know, we're walking shoulder to shoulder, guys. And I'm as responsible to be honest with you about where you're at and listen to you. Ask your sponsor how she's doing or he's doing. Give a crap. Because we only have each other. You know, so like we create celebrities in Alcoholics Anonymous just the way we create celebrities and personalities in the media. And it's my spiritual responsibility to put away my fear of looking bad, my fear of upsetting people, and honestly try to be a loving, kind human being and do for them what they do for me. You know, and my friend having almost having a nervous breakdown taught me that. Um, thank you. Question. Once you've done the steps and surrendered, can you speak about how one lives in the space between consciousness of a higher power and the difficult decisions one needs to make on a daily basis? How do you know a decision is God-centered and not more of me? Well, first of all, there is no surrendered once and for all. It doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, there's a line in step 11 in the book that I didn't understand it for a long time because I came here thinking that there was some kind of spiritual destination as a result of these steps. And the line says we must constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show. And I'm sober probably 15, 17 years sober, and I'm reading that one day and I'm thinking, well, why would they say we must constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show? And I realized, oh my God, it's because I'm constantly trying to run the show. That is what it is to be alcoholic. That is the nature of this malady. It's not something that you put behind you and never do that again. You're going to constantly have the inclination, the propensity to play God. That's, that's why alcoholism, this malady, this spiritual malady is a chronic illness. It's not an acute illness like pneumonia where you can medicate it and put it behind you and you no longer have a problem with pneumonia. This is more like diabetes of the spirit. Every single day is the day when I must adjust my spiritual blood sugar level because my natural inclination is to unsurrender myself and play God. There is no destination. And there's, there's a lot of things in Alcoholics Anonymous that, that are views of, spiritual, of a spiritual path. And one of them, and this really helps me a lot with decisions in my life and my approach to life. On page 100, it says, Both you and the new man must walk day by day on the path of spiritual progress. Now, that's a view of spiritual progress that where I'm not doing this alone. And any plan, I believe, for spiritual progress that's all about you and making you more wonderful or more happy is not a plan for spiritual progress. It's one more subtle, self-delusional plan for self-grandizement. Self, 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 self. Um, I There's a thing in the book that says when... Uh, when, ad, when in doubt, well, pause while agitated. You know, any, it, I've discovered something else. Any decision in my life that I feel have a, that has a sense of urgency, the urgency comes from self-will. There is no urgency in God in the realm of the spirit. That is only the urgency in here from self. Um, and I, some of the, one of the questions uh, I have to ask myself sometimes is, am I willing to live with this situation unresolved? And sometimes I go, hell no! <laughs> but I'm, if, I, if that's the answer, then I'm not surrendered. You know, and I shouldn't, I, can, I shouldn't kid Bob about Bob. 
I should realize that once once again I'm in charge. I have the, the words, what I want doesn't matter. I have them, well, I like to tattoo them to the inside of my eyelids. But, I mean, I have them written all over my house. I have them on my dashboard of my car. I have it on my fridge. I have it on my, my computer monitor. I have to remind myself all day long that what I want in any given situation doesn't matter. That it's my job to show up. That the outcome is none of my business. You know, every morning in my morning meditation, I try and I say out loud, God, I put my hand out. And I say, God, I put out my hand. I outstretch my hand to you. And I ask you to take my hand and walk with me through my life. That I give my decision making. I don't make decisions anymore. I give my decision making process over to God. And I let God make decisions for me. There are things or circumstances when I I absolutely know in my gut what is right. And when I'm fighting about something in my heart and my head, it's usually because I don't want to accept that circumstance, whatever it is. So that's why I have a sponsor. That's why I have a network. That's why I have 10-step buddies that I can't wait to talk about. That's why I do written nightly review. That's why I do a lot of those things, because there are ways. There are things. There are tools. That's why the big book talks about the, the kit of spiritual tools that are laid at, that's laid at our feet by our sponsor. There are things that help me to understand or to know what to do in my life. But in the end, the four absolutes, very simple, unselfish, pure, honest, and loving. If I can apply those or a circumstance, a decision, something that, uh, an opportunity, if those four absolutes show up, or that the, the thing, the option that I'm going to take, whether I do A or B, apply if the four absolutes are there and my, and my motives are clear, then it's something in my heart and my gut that I know that I should do. If I make a decision, take a job, don't take a job, move, don't move. If I'm under the delusion that I'm making a decision in the first place, but if I have an option like that and I'm not clear on those four absolutes, then it's probably a self-decision. And then it's just my experience that I sit with my sponsor and we say, is it a kind, loving, unselfish, honest, pure thing to do? And if it's not, then I don't do it. For me, it's just, it's very simple. I call it spiritual mathematics. And if I use this formula, it has yet to fail me. I failed it because I didn't use it. But if I use it, it doesn't fail. And it's just my experience, but there's no substitute for good sponsorship. Period. This, this next question is one I can really relate to a lot. It says, I need a sponsor in Denmark, but I cannot any find anyone I would trust and think, and I can't find anyone who I think is good enough for me. <laughs> what do I do? Oh, do I understand that one? I, you know, it's, I, I was, I remember in the years I was in and out that I kept relapsing. I knew I should get a sponsor. And, but there's nobody in AA that's really worthy of, of this tremendous mantle I would lay on them. Uh, uh, and consequently, I never got one. And I think eventually you'll get to a point where you'll start to realize that you better find somebody to run your life other than you. Because you get to a point where even even Charles Manson would make better decisions for you than you will. Uh, it gets to be, it's just it's like after a while, it's up, anybody that will take it, you can have it. <laughs> you just get somebody. Uh, what I did the last time when I when I started to become sponsorable, and I've had I've had two sponsors in the last 28 and a half years, and both times I did the same thing. I I asked God for help, and I followed it in close order with action. Close order, 
And I just, I said, God, just show me. And I saw a guy, and he was sober about almost 15 years when I was new, and I just thought, he's doing a lot better than I am, and I'll get him. And then when I was about uh, 15 years sober, I needed a new sponsor because I'd become too close of friends with mine, and I, I needed somebody, I needed someone that was going to beat me up a little bit. I, I, did, I wanted someone who I could get direction from. Uh, I was tired of feeling like I was a loose cannon in AA, and my sponsor just thought everything I was doing was wonderful. So I, I came down to two guys, and one of them today is my sponsor, and the other one is my spiritual advisor. And I needed somebody that was more active than me. And I got two guys in my life that are, are, that are wonderful. They're, they've walked down this road. The one guy's sober 48 years. The other guy's sober 50 years. And they're vital, everyday members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's, what do you want? If you, if, you want if you don't want to stay in AA, you'll probably find somebody to sponsor you that's backing out of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you want to stay in AA and not drink but smoke pot, you'll find somebody that smokes pot. If you want to stay in AA and don't drink but be a compulsive gambler, you'll find somebody to sponsor you that's a compulsive gambler. I encourage you to find somebody that's, that's this is the center of their life. It doesn't, not anybody that does it perfect, because there ain't nobody. There ain't nobody. But just somebody that every day tries to show up and do something in AA. You want to show me? You guys are going to hate me. I'm about to alienate someone, but I don't. Look, I don't think they're good enough for me. Look, my sponsor, if I said that to her, she would put a boot so far up my ass, her, her foot would come out my mouth. Um, guys, there's no... What's good or bad? You know, there are people in my area where I live who think, oh, you know, I saw Carrie at that convention. I heard her tape, you know, she sponsors so-and-so. She's really special. And then they meet me and they find out I'm a moron just like them. And they're kind of disappointed. They're like, oh, huh, you know, your tape, you sounded really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and they have a pre preconceived notion of who I am, you know, and it turns out that I'm just me and I'm human just like everyone else. There is no one who is good or worse, or anything else other, you know, like we're all human beings. We're all the same. We're all having a spiritual experience. I picked my sponsor because she lives her life in a way that I admire. It's that simple. And she doesn't care about my feelings. Well, actually, she cares more about my sobriety in my life than my feelings, and she's willing to ask me the hard questions. Period. You know, if I begin to think that there's no one in my area that's good enough for me, then my question is that I have to ask is, how close to a drink am I really? How much of my ego has gotten involved in, my, in the program of recovery? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Standing on tippy toes is a little difficult. Thank you. Oh, see, I got a booster seat. Um, how, much of my, how much of my program has become about me and about looking good? about being special, about being important, about being an authority. How attached am I to how people in AA see me? I gotta tell you what, I'm loved and hated in my area. There are people who love me to death because by the grace of God and God working through me, I've been able to help them to recover from their alcoholism. And there are other people who think I'm a mean, egotistical bitch who asks the hard questions and pisses them off. But the bottom line is this, is that if I start to think that I know something about this program of recovery and that I can't learn from the newcomer, that I can't learn from the person next to me, from my own child, i got to ask myself a real big question. Who do I think that I am? That I am not a child of God just like everyone else. And I'll tell you what, I used to think that I was special until my sponsor politely pointed out that I ain't. You know what she calls me? She calls me a big shot. 
big shot, big shot carry. You know, because, you know, I'm lucky and I do get invited to do these things and I never get invited back and I wonder why. It's probably because I answer questions like this the way that I do. Um, <laughs> and, you know, in Switzerland, I yelled at people about sponsorship. Now I'm calling people egotistical. But <laughs> my point is, is this, is that, um, you know, my sponsor calls me Big Shot and she kind of makes fun of me because of it. She calls me Big Shot Carrie, Big Shot, Big Shot. That's because you're a big shot. And I point out that I pay her the big bucks because she's the one who doesn't care whether or not I'm a big shot and asks me the hard questions. Because I'm an alcoholic. I'm going to die a spiritual death. And my, al my ego will have me out of Alcoholics Anonymous so quickly because I think I know something. What I would suggest to anybody who is feeling this way Take the set-aside prayer or the lay-aside prayer into your morning meditation every day. Ask God to help you to set aside everything you think you know about yourself, the 12 steps, the program of recovery, and God in order to have a new experience with these steps and help you to see the truth. Because I need to keep going back to God in order to get clearer and clearer and clearer. And you know what? My sponsor is... I've had several sponsors over the years. I've had wonderful sponsors over the years. I am extremely lucky. And I've had great spiritual advisors. I've had wonderful people and wonderful teachers. And I get that I'm a lucky girl in that respect, that I know some awesome people. On the other hand, you know, there's no magic miracle to this. It's in the book. You read it. You do what it says. And you get awake. You know, there's no, you know, guru, there's no anything like that. It's not like, you know, it's this big mystery. You write a four-step, you get honest, you share it with somebody, you ask God to remove the crap you learned about it, you say you're sorry and pay back the money, and you try to live in 10, 11, and 12 and pray and meditate every day and try not to piss people off. And guess what? You don't want to drink anymore. Yay! Miracle! It doesn't have to be complicated. I complicate it because I'm a screwed up alcoholic who complicates everything. I complicate putting on my pants. You know, I complicate paying parking tickets. You know, and I'm, like I said, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not trying to be a brat. I'm not trying to anything. I'm just trying to tell you exactly what my sponsor told me when I told her I think that I need somebody better than her because, you know, she's not sober long enough. And she laughed in my face. Because I'm sober longer than her, and I thought to myself, I said, you know, my sponsor's only sober eight years, I'm sober 12, maybe I should upgrade. So I called her up, and I said, guess what I just thought, I think I need to upgrade. And she laughed in my face, and she said, I think you should take that one to God, and click. So, I, you know, I'm not saying that I'm not capable of thinking like that, but when I'm thinking like that, I need to ask myself one question. Where's God? Where's a higher power? Thank you. One, one other thing. Sponsorship rela is a relationship. And like all relationships, it's not a success as a result of finding the right person. It's a success as a result of being the right person. And when you're looking for the right person, you got the cart before the horse. It's not finding the right sponsor. It's being sponsorable. The Hindus have a saying that the burden of learning the lesson is always on the student. It's never on the teacher. I've seen some people achieve tremendous spiritual growth with goofy sponsors. Goofy sponsors. They grow way past their sponsor quickly because they were sponsorable. And that sponsor is an instrument. And I've seen some people that have had the most amazing sponsors in Alcoholics Anonymous and they stay stuck because they're not sponsorable. Remember who has to become... If you're, if you're sponsorable, anybody can help you, as long as it's not you. Um, do we want to take a break or start step nine? Um, do you guys want a break or what do you want to do? We, have, it's like we can either start step nine or take a break. Why don't we take a break till right straight up at five, four o'clock? We'll start promptly at four, huh? Yeah.